All right, first, uh, thanks a lot for coming on here. I appreciate it. Um, I've always been fascinated and very impressed with your career. I mean, you uh, went to, into a place, and we can, we'll can we get to it when we get to it, but I, I always want to say it up front about the things that, like, uh, that I have really impressed me about you is, like, where you went, like, you're, to achieve – that kind of status and then that kind of um, that level of operator uh, is just fascinating to me. I think it's super cool. So I, um, yeah, I, I thank you for coming on. I, I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, JD, man, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to to chat with you and your viewers, and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Cool. Yeah. So let's start it off. Um, a lot of guys just kind of talk about how they got in the military, like what prompted them to to join up, and then we just kind of go chronologically from there. So yeah, tell me about your your pre-military days and what, what got you in the military? Yeah. So I'm originally from uh, central Missouri, a small farm town, about 5,000 people or so. So I uh, consider myself pretty lucky. You know, I knew from a very early age, you know, probably, you know, before I was 10, that the military was something that I wanted to pursue. Um, I come from a long lineage of uh, military service members. Obviously my, uh, all of my grandparents, Grandfathers were in World War II, uh, you know, in the Army, the Navy. Uh, my uncles were was in a Navy corpsman in Vietnam. So, you know, I, I had that kind of sense of patriotism and, and sense of service. Uh, and so that's I always knew that it was something I wanted to do. Uh, didn't really know much about the, the military, even though I wanted to pursue it. And, and a lot of my family members had served. You know, they never really talked about it. You know, uh, right. my grandpa never talked about it. My, my uncle never really talked about his service, uh, in Vietnam as a, as a Navy corpsman. He was, he was wounded, got sent home. So, uh, but again, I, I was always kind of enamored, um, uh, in their presence. And, and, you know, I used to look at my grandpa's, you know, medals from World War II and I thought that was just so cool, man. So, um, so yeah, I, I just, you know, and, uh, it might sound silly or stupid, but, you know, back in the day, you know, when, Stallone was doing his Rambo movies, right? Like, dude, I was oh, yeah. watching Rambo. I'm like, dude, that's what I want to do, man. I want to be Rambo. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, it really, that's that's kind of what drove me to uh, to service. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, when did you join up? When when did you actually sign the papers? I signed. I did a delayed enlistment my beginning of my senior year, I guess, of '95, and then okay. uh, shipped out to boot camp, like two months after I graduated in 96. Nice. What'd you think? We, a couple guys have been talking about, uh, air force, mm -hmm. uh, boot camp, if you will. Um, yeah. how, what was your experience? I, I know when I went through, it was very laxed and not challenging at all. Um, what was your experience? Yeah, pretty similar. You know, I, um, so I'll say I originally was going to join the Marine Corps and, okay. uh, I had some older buddies that had, graduated a year or two ahead of me and they, they were uh, in the Marine Corps infantry. And of course they come home on leave and, you know, they're, they're part of the uh, recruiters assistance program and the, you know, they're beating down my door and I'm like, yeah, dude, let's do this. And so I had initially started to uh, sign up with the Marine Corps and uh, my stepdad at the time was uh, active duty air force. He was, I think he was a master sergeant at the time. He was stationed over in Turkey and uh, he came home on, on like mid tour leave or something and found out that I'd started to join with the Marines. And he's like, no dude, and dragged me over to the air force recruiter. And um, again, I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to join the military and, and serve in, in combat and, and contribute in, in that sort of way. And so, you know, obviously the, the air force there's, there's on the enlisted side, at least there's uh, very few opportunities that, that present that coming out the gate. And so right. uh, I initially signed up to, to go uh, to become a combat controller. And so I, I did a fair amount of training, uh, although obviously wasn't successful um, <laughs> leading into boot camp. Um, but back then it, it, there wasn't a lot of information about it. I do recall, you know, the, the trifold brochure in the uh, high school counselor's office that had the uh, kind of the overhead shot of the guy with all, all, right. the, all the kit laid on the ground. And I was like, okay, well, at least the Air Force does some cool stuff. So uh, <laughs> I'll try that. And, um, but to your question, you know, boot camp was, was pretty underwhelming. Okay. I, was, I was pretty disappointed to be honest with you. Um, I felt like, you know, the standards were, were really easy uh, to e exceed. Um, yeah. I thought that, 
uh, most of the other airmen I was going through training with were just kind of skating by and they, they really wouldn't pushing themselves to their full potential. So I was, I was pretty disappointed. Um, yeah. so, I mean, that, that was kind of my yeah. uh, boot camp experience. I think it's changed a lot now. I think they've really revamped it and they get like, they go to the field for a week, I think, and like learn a bunch of combat skills. But yeah, back in the, back in the early nineties, when you and I can't joined, it was not, not, not a lot, not, not much, a lot of marching around yeah. and not much PT and, I was like, oh, this is it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Carrying around your, your Lackland lasers and your portfolio. Right. That, that didn't really instill a lot of, you know, <laughs> war fighting prowess. Yeah, exactly. So you got through basic. So you, do you, uh, did you get it TACP guaranteed as you came in or did you go to the no. room like during basic or tell me about that? Tell me about that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a funny story. So like I said, um, I get back then they still had the, the OLH, um, after boot camp. So if you're going to go that, that route, that's kind of the, the path, but I can't remember what week it was of boot camp, probably like week four or five. They, whoever was going to, you know, Roger up to, to go try combat control or prayer rescue. You, you went over and you did the pass test uh, yeah. during boot camp. And so that was my real, that was my first kind of, well, that was my first like failure, like blatant failure. Like I didn't even pass the freaking pass test in boot camp to to even gain entry into the initial pipeline to do yeah. you know the profession that I had wanted to do so so that hit me you know that was a, a wake up call for me number one like I, I didn't train properly obviously the, the water was what what got me and I'm like I completely underestimated that um, and so so then I'm sitting there I'm like damn what do I do and the survival, the, the SEER cadre had done some briefing and that I, there was an opportunity to go and kind of do some, uh, they, they give you a site test and some interviews. And so I'm like, okay, well, at least we get to be out in the woods. If I go, if I, I can go do that. So I went over there, did the, the psych eval test for, for SEER instructor. And then, um, was in the, like the post test interview with the, there's a female captain or something that was doing it and she was reviewing my results and, and she's like, yeah, uh, you know, based on your, your psych profile and your, your testing results, like you're, you're not a good fit for, to be a SEER instructor. And so that was like Jeez. the second, <laughs> like, you know, punch to the face, in, yeah. you know, the same day, really, I think I went over there the same day. Uh, and so then I get back to the barracks and I'm like, damn dude, like, because my fallback was uh, what my stepdad had had suggested, because that's what he did, of course. Yeah. Uh, which was was computer systems operator, and I'm <laughs> like, this is going to be my life, dude. Like, uh, I don't even at that time, you know, mid '90s, like computers still weren't like super highly proliferated. Right, right. And I didn't really care about computers if, if I even knew what one was. So, anyway. Uh, that was my fate after boot camp was to head down to Keesler Air Force Base, Mississippi, and start the computer systems operations tech school, which was uh, I did not enjoy it to be <laughs> quite honestly with you. But I, yeah. I was the, so. But here's another thing: I, I hated it. I hated every minute of it. Uh, but I ended up being distinguished graduate of my tech school class uh, down there in Keesler. So. I mean, I mean, it, yeah, whatever, I mean, just the kind of guy you are, that's what it doesn't matter if you're in computer class or, you know, selection for the 24th or whatever, you're going to be, you're going to try to excel. So that I mean, it just kind of speaks to you and where you probably w wanted to go somewhere else, but you know, you're here, yeah. you know, you're not going to sham, you're going to do your yeah. best anyway, and regardless of what you're doing. So yeah, I could yeah. see that. Yeah. There's a whole lot of shaming going on at Keesler, man. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's Biloxi, so, yeah, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a fun, nice place to sham, you know? Yeah, well, yeah of course. So, so and then yeah, what happened? Was, uh, yeah. So first assignment, uh, right out the gate was, was Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii, nice. uh, which is pretty epic for, you know, 18 year old kid. Yeah. Uh, never been outside the, the, you know, mainland. So get out there and again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a computer guy, man, uh, <laughs> computer human, I guess. <laughs> and I didn't like it, you know, um, 
but you know, again, I, I brought the, you know, I brought my best foot forward every, every day uh, of duty um, and, and quickly excelled. I think there was actually like four or five airmen in our tech school, you know, class that, that all got stationed in Hawaii. So okay. uh, most of us knew each other from, from there. And we, we all got, you know, the five of us got assigned to the same unit actually and doing the exact same thing. Yeah. And so, you know, again, for me, it was just mind numbing, monotonous, busy work in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so it was, well, I was just going to ask you, like you, you mentioned that there, I mean, as we know, computers weren't very popular back then. I mean, it was like, it wasn't like yeah. it is today. So what, what kind of work were you doing? I mean, not to get too geeky about it, yeah. but it's just, it's, you know, yeah, I mean, they... it, so it, I was assigned to this, uh, it was called the Regional Information Protection Center. And basically at headquarters PACAF, it was, I was assigned to headquarters PACAF. And so our job there basically was to, to monitor all the incoming traffic that was coming into the uh, PACAF networks, uh, not just on Hickam, but all the, across all the PACAF bases. Oh, okay. And there, there's basically this, this, call it a sniffer for lack of a better term that sits out in front of the, the, all the base networks and it collects every single uh, piece of traffic that coming into the network. And, and then there's an algorithm that kind of flags potential suspicious activity. And then our job, the airman's job would, would be in to go and, and um, kind of analyze what that traffic is in, in okay. order to confirm or deny a potential uh, intrusion, uh, unauthorized intrusion into the network. And, and if so, then, you know, we write up a report and send it up the chain of command. It's sometimes we get the, the uh, FBI involved if it was a civilian trying to, to do something. Uh, so that, that was basically the, the gig. Um, again, for whatever reason, I, my staff sergeant saw some potential in me. And about six months after doing that, he pulled me off the line doing that and started teaching me how to write uh, code. Because what his job was, was to actually conduct uh, offensive attacks against our own networks in order to identify vulnerabilities. So oh, okay. he started teaching me how to do that. And that, that was a, a, a lot more fun uh, yeah. in, in that role. And so that, that was not too bad. But again, it was computers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, how long did you do that before you got over to the tech B side? Yeah, so right just over three years and that's kind of okay. a funny story so um i would i'll just straight up like i was not the i, I performed well during duty hours like i was a, a high performer during duty hours but i certainly uh kept to the 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 mantra of you know play hard work hard and right. so in my off duty hours man i was burning it down yeah. and and so that that caught me into some trouble and I found myself uh, several times, but one time in particular on base detail, uh, on the recycling detail, which is basically you cruise around the entire base and you sort through everybody's trash, pulling out recycling items. So that was my punishment at one time. And I happened to be on that detail with the tag P. He was there for very similar purposes. Yeah. And and so, you know, we, we, were sp we spent that week together on that detail and uh, I'd never met him before. And I started asking him about, you know, the, the profession and, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, he was stationed up at the 25th ASOS and r really good dude. Matter of fact, um, uh, we just hosted him and his wife at our house uh, a couple months ago. And so uh, anyway, he, he invited me up to the unit uh, there at the 25th. Uh, and actually, they got me out on an exercise with the 25th uh, Infantry Division. And man, it, like, as soon as I got back from that, um, man, I was hooked. I'm like, this is this is what I'm going to do. And nice. at that point, you know, you had to you had to wait. I think it was like 36 months before you could submit a, a retraining package. Yeah. And so I, I was just waiting for that that time. And I remember I would go down to the MPF like twice a week and <laughs> back then they had like le legit like hard copy printouts of right. all the jobs that were available to retrain into and and 
Tech P wasn't on there for the longest time. And until like one week, one day I went down there and I was sorting through it. And I'm like, okay, this is where it should be. And it's like, boom, it's there. And there were six, six slots to retrain. And, and I'm like, man, I don't know, this is pretty bad odds. And so <laughs> anyway, um, submitted my retraining package as soon as I could, uh, as soon as I was eligible. And, um, you know, luckily I, I was able to get one of those slots. So that's how okay. it happened. And it, so I retrained in, in 2000. Uh, into the tech big career field. Do you want to name drop the the guy? I think I'm pretty sure I we had him on here. Uh, who who's the guy you hooked you were on the detail with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Billy Otter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otter was on. Did you listen to his episode? He he mentioned the, no, the story. Didn't. Yeah. Oh, so that's did? funny that you, you're talking about it too. Yeah. So it's hilarious. Yeah, we we reminisced about it uh, when he was at the house. So. Well, I mean, I talk about this with a lot of guys like you. Otter, you know, even uh, Doug Tillman was on, and we we all talk about how if we were airmen today, yeah. we probably wouldn't be in the military anymore. We'd probably be would have uh, been yeah. kicked out long ago, you know. So, Absolutely. kind of fortunate in the time that we were in that we could like make those mistakes, and we had good supervisors, yeah. and we had good people that were like looking out for us. But yeah, well, I, th- uh, I think that's that's the big difference, right? Is is there's back then. You know, everyone, everybody wasn't, you know, straight and narrow in a, in a square. Like, you know, you went through adversity, you made mistakes. Yeah. Um, and, and we had leadership, uh, you know, thankfully that, that recognized that. And, you know, you're, you're dealing with, you know, young Americans that uh, are just now probably for the first time in their lives out on their own and, you know, experiencing life and, you know, people are going to make mistakes, man. Sure. And I, I'll, I'll tell you a hundred percent, um, not just that mistake, but I've made a lot of mistakes throughout my career. And there's, there's no way I'd be sitting where I am today without the, the support and the leadership and the, uh, the leaders that gave me, you know, second chances. So same, um, same here that, that always resonated with me. And I always appreciated that. I, I never took it for granted. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, as I matured in my leadership development, um, you know, I always reflected back on that when, you know, when I was, you know, helping mentoring and, and trying to get airmen back on the right path after a mistake. So, yeah, uh, I think that's, what's lacking in my opinion nowadays, uh, certainly within the air force is, you know, we like to call it a, a one mistake air force, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but, um, I, I do hear a lot of stories and I've seen it firsthand where, you know, it's almost like a, a badge of honor for a leader to just hammer smash somebody, yeah. in my opinion, for, for things that are pretty irrelevant. Um, right. So like in the grand scheme anyway. of things, the kid messed yeah. up, you know, he might've got a little drunk yeah. and there, it seems like people are so worried about what their boss is going to think about them that they're not looking out for their own guys, you know, instead of being 100%. that buffer between them they're almost like on not, you know, they're on their boss's side to crush those guys. Like you said, yeah, it's kind of frustrating. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and, and really the opposite should be, you know, your, your go-to, right. It's like, what, right. what can I do for this airman and their family to, to enable them to uh, bounce back and recover from this mistake instead right. of what is my, what's going to make me as a leader look good to, to my, chain of command so that, that I continue my career progression. Right. Unfortunately, I think the, the latter tends to drive most of the disciplinary decisions in my experience. Yeah. yeah they don't want to either. They, they want to uh, excel in their career or they don't want to get in trouble themselves. So they're like, well, I'll yeah. just sacrifice this guy. So I don't get, you know, re- reprimanded by my boss or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. It's frustrating. Yeah. It's, it's, it is frustrating for sure. So, okay. So you, um, so yeah, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. So you got you you were of six slots. You got one of those, and then yeah, go from there. Tell me about that. Yeah, so I, I left Hawaii in March of two thousand. Uh, since I was a retrainee, I, I got an assignment before I went to tech school, which was uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, uh, nice. best post in the army, <laughs> and so uh, that was really awesome because Colorado is a, a great place to live, uh, yeah. just a phenomenal, uh, atmosphere, a great unit there. Uh, and so I, I PCS to Fort Carson, um, before going to tech school, I was there about two and a half months, maybe, uh, before I, I pushed down to, to Herbert field, 
uh, which was which was good because, you know, obviously I, I fell into an, an operational squadron, uh, started to meet the guys in the unit, uh, immediately started to to learn from them, which obviously helped me uh, during tech school. Uh, and so, yeah, it was just a great it was a great unit at the time, still is. Uh, yeah. And and, you know, so I went down to, to Herbert Field with a, a good sense of confidence uh, I was going to be successful. Yeah. So got down there probably, you know, April or something like that, 2000. Uh, Eagle 5-2 was, was our flight there and uh, progressed through tech school uh, in, the, in the heat of the summer, which was awesome. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we had a great, great team down there during tech school. Uh, I don't think we lost too many. Uh, there's probably a handful or something. I don't know, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Overall, I think, you know, I was one of probably four, I think, uh, retrainees, uh, on that flight. I, I was a senior airman at the time. Nice. Uh, we had a, I think we had a tech sergeant, a couple staffs and, uh, maybe another senior airman, but, but yeah, it was, it was a good time. I had, a, it, that, that's the, the first time, uh, in my air force career, uh, you know, again, as a senior airman where I was like, okay, this, now I feel like I'm actually in the military. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, now I, I feel like I'm, I'm, in, I'm at least a part of the community that can make a difference in combat. And, right. and so, so that, that kind of restoked my, my sense of purpose and, and drive to, to serve. Cause quite, I'll be honest with you. If had I not gotten that retraining slot, I, I would have gotten out because there's yeah. no way I was going to go through an entire career as a, as a computer <laughs> nerd. Um, so, so yeah, very, very fortunate that, uh, that was the case. Yeah. Uh, so how was tech school for you? Pretty, um, I, yeah, you said it was a good, a good experience. Was it tough for you having come out of, uh, um, the computer world or was it like, were you, did you keep staying in shape or, because a lot of guys say when, yeah. when they cross train there, they may not have prepped properly or, you know, or maybe they didn't and they just crushed it or how, how was your experience? Yeah, it, it was good. I, I, uh, learned my lesson from boot camp and failing, um, you know, the past test. So oh, I, yeah. I was, <laughs> and, I, and I always had a, a, a solid, you know, discipline and, and physical fitness, you know, from a young age. So, um, I, I was prepared physically, I was prepared okay. mentally. So, I mean, it was, it was challenging, uh, but I, I wouldn't say it was overwhelming. Um, and so, so tech school for me was, was really fun. Nice. Uh, and, and, you know, the things that, you know, you, you do in training and, you know, whether you're getting smoked or, uh, sleep deprived or fatigued, whatever the case may be, like, and just because you're the environment that we were doing that the training is, is conducted in like that, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, so for me, you know, I was having a great time. Uh, and then even if it, you know, if it did start to really suck, uh, which was not that often really for me, I would just reflect back in, in my time sitting behind a computer. <laughs> and I'm like, well, at least I'm not doing that. Right. So it could, it could always be worse. And so right. that's, pretty much all I needed to, to stay motivated. Yeah. 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 I know what you mean. Like when I, when I first got there, it was like, they give you a ruck and they get, you know, you, uh, helmet and all that, all that gear. And you're like, okay, this is it. This is like, it kind of, yeah. kind of harkening back to what you were saying about Rambo and, you know, it's kind of cheesy, but at, when you're yeah. a kid, I mean that you're, it's like, you now you're really doing it regardless of how close it is or how cheesy Rambo is, but you're like, you kind right. of get that sense of like motivation for sure. Yeah. And, and certainly, a sense of camaraderie, uh, with oh, your for sure. yeah. that you're going through with, um, you know, every, everybody's going to have ups and downs. Uh, everybody's going to be, you know, uh, the front runner at times and, and other times you're going to be, you know, farther towards the back. And, and, but the, the team mentality, uh, is certainly something that, that resonates with me, you know, having played, you know, sp sports growing up and was always drawn towards, team oriented activities. And so yeah. obviously our, our community provides that opportunity and, um, you know, it's just a good fit for me. So, so you started tech school, like you said in 2000. So when you got out, how, how far, like, when did you graduate tech school? It, it was it still 2000, I, like later that year. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I graduated, I think it was like August of 2000. 
Um, and then went, went straight back to, I, I was a little upset because I had, uh, you know how they had back then they had the, uh, you know, top performers would, you would compete for airborne slot. Right. And so I, I was certainly, I wanted to do that. Right. And so I, I was, I threw my name in a hat, was competing for, for one of those, I think there was maybe three airborne slots that our flight was going to be eligible for. And, um, I ended up, I, I was recommended to get one, but because I'd already PCS to Carson, oh, that's they're right. like, no, you're not, because, you know, if you got an airborne slot, you know, you were going to the 14th. And yeah. so I remember the, uh, our lead instructor, he pulled me aside one day and he's like, Hey man, like, dude, you, you would have got like, you were my recommendation, but you're, you're already assigned to, to Carson. So it's not beneficial to the air force to PCS you again. Right. Uh, just to, you know, so I'm like, I was pissed about that, but you know, again. Yeah. And they couldn't give you the slot cause then you're it's, they need those airborne slots at the 14th. So like if you right. would have taken that one and gone back to the 13th, you'd have been like, yeah, kind of not wasted, but essentially wasted yeah. in their, in the air yeah. force's eyes. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. yeah that sucks. Yeah. Institution over airmen in that case. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, graduated, uh, I was fortunate. I was, uh, DG of, of that. And nice. um, so, but again, it was, that's not a knock on, on my teammates, but again, I, I was there for a purpose. Right. Um, I, I was there to, to accomplish something that, um, that, uh, I wanted to do. I wanted to be, again, a part of a, a community that, that made a difference in, uh, direct combat. And so, um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to be, to be put in that place, uh, both in a leadership role during tech school and, and, uh, you know, be successful. So, yeah. Yeah. I found that cross trainees and, and this is a hard and fast rule, but a lot of cross trainees are more motivated than even guys like us who came in at, right out of basic, you know, because we're kind of trying to figure it out and don't know what we're doing, but like a cross trainee is like, they're made that decision. Yeah. That's what you wanted to do. So I could see how you would excel you know, going in there and just being super motivated, especially looking backwards and being like, I don't want to go back to the computer world. So I better, yeah. do, I better do well in here. <laughs> exactly. So you got, so exactly. you uh, graduated and then you got back to the 13th. Uh, and that was kind of like, I mean, in the coming months, I mean, nine 11 is going to happen. So tell me about that. Like when you got back, uh, how was your training and then what happened yeah. after the towers fell? Yeah. So you know, back then there, the JTAC term was not a thing. It was, we were still ETAC. So enlisted right. terminal attack controllers. And so as soon as I got back from tech school, uh, I immediately, you know, snapped LinkedIn with, with, you know, legends in our community, like, like Tommy case and, uh, and others, and just learned as much as I could from those guys. And, yeah. um, my goal was to, to get through my, my five level CDCs as fast as possible so that I could um, get to GFCC, Joint Firepower Control Course, and and become a, an ETAC, right? Yeah. And so that that was the next goal that I set for myself. And you know, the Air Force has freaking timelines for everything. So that the fastest that the Air Force would allow you to complete your five level upgrade, uh, it was nine months, and and I hit that nine month mark uh, on the day. <laughs> and so that was the gate that I had to achieve before. My, my leadership would, would support me going to joint firepower control course. So right. again, I set those goals. Um, I, I met them, uh, I did everything my leadership asked me to do and, and was, was again, fortunate enough to, to get that, that head nod to, to push out to GFCC in, um, the summer of 2001. And so I, I, I went through GFCC with, with some other legend, you know, Mark Foster was there. Uh, we were teammates going through GFCC. Nice. And so that was the summer of 2001, get back and leading into 9-11, right? You're just prepping for that. Uh, for me at, at that point, I was just prepping from my initial eval. Mm -hmm. And so on 9-11, I was actually, this is, it's kind of ironic. I, I was supposed to get my initial tack eval on 9-11 wow and so you know I'd, I'd done all my mission planning I, I was out in the motor pool loading up the the, the vehicle getting ready to, to head down range for my eval and my my uh uh flight chief comes out and he's like hey brett i need you to go to the gym grab all the guys from pt 
and bring him back to the squadron. Uh, they just had a terrorist attack. And I'm like, I thought this was part of my scenario. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, I'm but like, that's kind of funny. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, I'm like, man, why, why are you messing with me, dude? Like I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get my shit together. Right. And now you're, you're throwing, you know, changes in here. And so, right, right. so I drove down to the gym to get the guys. And I remember walking to the gym and the, you know, the, the, the front desk people had uh, the TV on. And I just happened to, to glance over as I was walking by to get the guys and, and the news was up and I didn't yeah. really pay attention. So I was trying to rally the cats. I'm like, Hey guys, we got to get back to the squadron. I don't know what the hell's going on, but you know, <laughs> you know, it's starting to need us back there. And, and as I was leaving, I, I poked my head in the office and saw the, the second plane hit on, on TV. Wow. And then I was like, damn, like he's not messing around. Like this is actually happening. So, right, right. so, you know, we all got back to the unit. Um, you know, it was just like, I'm sure everybody's got the same kind of stories. Like it was chaos. Nobody really try, knew what, knew what was going on, trying to sort through all the chaff of what's, what's fact, what's not. And right. So, I mean, it was, that's kind of the way it was. Mm -hmm. Obviously I didn't get my email that day. Yeah. Uh, it was delayed. Did they lock down Carson like everybody else? I mean, I know Benning was just a traffic jam. They just locked everything down and yeah, you know. yeah. It's everything was locked down, uh, and we were. And so we get back, and you know, of course, I don't know if it's, it's right to say, but I mean, we're kind of like, obviously, we're all fired up. It's like, man, this, you know, we're somebody's attacking America, like, um, but there's also on the other side of it, it's like, okay, like it's go time, right? Like yeah. now we're going to have the opportunity to go and, and do what we came in to do. So you know, it was kind of bittersweet in that, um, unfortunate events and loss of life, uh, as the, that was the, really the catalyst for, for a lot of us having the opportunity to go down and, you know, achieve some, some goals that we had. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So then tell me about that. Tell me about, so you didn't get your eval that day. Uh, yeah, tell me about that. Like, um, when you ended up getting your eval, when you got your ETAC status and then some deployments after, you know, the, the, um, after that, after 9-11. Yeah. yeah. So I think I got my initial eval maybe a month later in uh, early October. And then it was, then my next goal was, okay, how, uh, how do I get down range as, as quick as possible? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> there was some frustration there, at least from, from, probably not just me, but a lot of guys at 13th, you know, obviously the, the 13th at the time, uh, had a, a flight that supported 10 special forces group. And, uh, I think you had Sean on here, you know, not too long ago, but Sean Mignon was, was, uh, yeah, he's coming on at, at next after you. Oh, so. is he? Okay. Awesome. Yep, yep. So, <clears throat> so Sean, Sean was over there, uh, along with some other folks and, uh, obviously they, they got the, the call immediately. And those guys pushed out and did some phenomenal uh, stuff. But I was still on the conventional side at the time, uh, uh, aligned with uh, 18th Infantry, 3rd Brigade, 4th Infantry Division. And, you know, on the conventional side, it's like, man, like a lot of things have to, to get set in motion to, to maneuver the big, big green machine, right? And, yeah. and 4th ID at the time, uh, wasn't getting tapped to, to go and do anything in Afghanistan. So really, uh, it was just us <clears throat> begging and pleading the, our chain of commands, like, Hey man, like, how do we get down range? Like, wh where are the gaps? Um, who needs support so forth and so on. So, um, that, I, that first opportunity didn't come for me until, uh, May of 2002. Okay. And so, you know, that, it took me a quite a while to get over there. Um, and so me and, and, uh, my buddy Kyle McSherry, we, we deployed to Afghanistan, uh, to Balad in, in early May of 2002. And really we didn't have any, any guidance on who we were going to support, you know, who we were supposed oh, really? to link up with. It was like, just get over there and figure it out. And okay. so... <laughs> So we get was on it the conventional deck. or was it, were you supporting the soft guys or how, what was the kind of the, the intent? It, you know, there was no intent. Really? Okay. Like, okay. You guys want to go. All right. Here's, here's a, 
get on this bird and and show up and then just figure oh it God. out. So, Jeez. so that's what we did. And so we get over there, and obviously the uh, third ASOG had a contingent over there running the ASOC, and obviously there's a lot of other uh, TACPs that were over there with the 101st, and uh, obviously all the soft guys were there. We we had a great uh, a load there. Uh, captain at the time, Captain uh, Chapadel goes by Chappie. You know, I think he's he's well known in the community. Uh, huge advocate for us. And, yeah. And so, so Kyle and I got with Chappie, and we're like, "Hey, sir, like, we're not cut out for the ASOC. We didn't come here to do that. Uh, how how do we get get out in the field? Can you find us a unit that needs some some uh, again ETACs at the time? Um, and and he did, man. Like he went out and and searched around and he uh we ended up getting assigned to four or five commando british royal marines and which was which was pretty awesome and so so kyle kyle and i were uh and we had one other tech p with us initially and i'm going to get into this story because i want people to take this lesson away so anyway we get assigned to initially we were with uh whiskey company uh, four or five commando. And so we infilled with them down in the Southeast portion of, uh, Afghanistan along the border. Our mission was just to con- pretty much conduct, um, presence patrols along the border, um, try to, try to run into anybody, uh, and then confirm or deny a bunch of cave complexes that are, are in that area, uh, and denied use, um, future use by the enemy. So that was, I'll tell you, like you, you learn, you don't know what you don't know. Uh-huh. And that first assignment with, with the Marines was, was very eye opening. Like I, I thought my field skills were good, um, but they weren't. And, uh-huh. and I'll tell you, like, uh, the British Royal Marines are like legit. Right. Yeah. And they, they live in the field and those guys are ninjas in the field. <laughs> and so, uh, super fortunate to have that opportunity to, to learn and serve with those, uh, prestigious organization, like, like four or five commando and, uh, learned a lot from them. Um, the story I'll get into. <clears throat> so, like I said, when we initially infilled, it was, it was myself, Kyle and, and a third human being, which I'll, I won't put his name out there. Uh, but we went in like super heavy, right? Like super heavy helmet, body armor, ammo, weapon, you know, water, chow, 117 Fox, you know, so the, the old school, big one, big SATCOM antenna, you know, old school plugger, Mark seven spotting scope batteries for <laughs> yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like it was ridiculous yeah. and certainly not capable of, of, uh, you know, individual movement tactics, uh, right, within right. a sense of, of speed. So, uh, but we started mo- maneuvering up into the mountains and, uh, we, we did this company movement on the third day. We were going to do about a 15 K movement, uh, with the whole company. And so, uh, there's three troops in the company at the time. And so, uh, since I was the lead guy, uh, I put, uh, Kyle was in the rear. Uh, this other guy was supposed to be in the, with the lead troop. And then I was going to be in the center with the, the company commander and Sergeant major. And so we, we, we get it. Company gets mustered, step off this guy. He's standing right next to me. And you know, it's maybe like two in the morning. And I'm like, Hey dude, like I told you, like you're supposed to be with the lead troop. You know, you're going to be the lead with the lead troop, you know? So if we come in contact, you're, you're going to be the guy. Right. I'll coordinate everything from here, blah, blah, blah. So we had coverage, you know, front, yeah. center and rear. And uh, so he's like, okay. And this, I, I should note, like this dude is, he's massive. Like he's like bodybuilder guy. Okay. And the day before we infilled with a, a case of MREs in addition to the three days of supply that we had in our ruck. Kyle and I had pushed out, you know, for a couple of days with uh, a couple of recce teams and we'd come back and this, this dude had stayed at the MSS. We get back and, you know, we, we Winchester all of our, our child that was in our rucks, 
but we knew we had a case of MREs back at the NSS. We get back and I go find this dude. I'm like, Hey dude, like, um, where, where's the MREs? I need to reset my gear. And he's like, what do you mean? What MREs? This guy had eaten all 12 MREs plus the three that he brought in his ruck. Oh my in, God. In three days. And I'm like, dude, that, that, that case was supposed to resupply all three of us, man. And he's like, Oh dude, I got, uh, you know, okay. My bad. Uh, I so mean, anyway, forget that, about, that, wait, just, Forget about the fact that he kind of screwed you guys over, but just consuming that amount of calorie. I mean, I don't, I can't even, I don't even know well, what the calorie count is now, but it's like three or four thousand calories of an MRE or something, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it was, un, I can't even, un, how do you even yeah, do it, un, first of all? That's crazy. Yeah. But he crushed him, man. And, Jesus. Uh, so I was like, well, that sucks because the next resupply is going to come for another uh, two and a half day, or two days. So anyway, uh, I was it. Kyle and I were able to, you know, scrounge some some chow from the Brits. And um, so anyway, we're stepping off back to the story. So we're stepping off. So this is the kind of guy that I know now. I know I'm dealing with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who's not where he's supposed to be when we're stepping off on the movement. Uh, and so I'm like, hey man, get your ass up there. So he kind of starts waddling off, and um, not. Five minutes later, he's he's starting to fall back to where I'm I am again, and I'm coming up to him. And I'm like, again, it's it's nighttime. I'm trying to maintain noise discipline. He's got his freaking helmet like carabiner to the outside of his ruck, and every time it, he walks, it's like making noise. And I come up to him like, dude, like, get your shit scored away. Uh, so I strapped his helmet down. I told him get up to the front. He he just couldn't get there. And he kept falling back. Uh, he would fall back to me and he'd fall back behind me. I'd go back and, and get him. And, and this, this is like, you know, 45 minutes into the, the movement. And so I knew that this was going to be a problem and it just got worse. And so what we ended up having to do was, uh, we had to stop the entire company, uh, probably half hour later. And by this time it's starting to get, light out yeah. and Kyle and I brought Kyle up and I'm like, uh, I made him, you know, take his ruck off. We started going through his ruck cause we were, Kyle and I are going to cross load all this stuff into our stuff, our rucks. Kind of lighten the load, let him get, let him have a, yeah. you know, a lighter ruck to get hang with yeah. his guys. Yeah, exactly. And, and I opened up his ruck dude and I'm not lying. There was a, a, a jug of protein powder in his rucksack oh my God. and what? Uh, yeah and Come so on and so i'm like you gotta be kidding me dude and so anyway kyle and i cross-loaded uh as much as we could shove into our rucks at that point yeah uh, some of the brits came up and and took some of his stuff uh i i threw his protein powder in the ditch and <laughs> so basically he was carrying uh, a rock, basically an empty rock, basically. And I'm like, okay, there, there's absolutely no reason that you should be falling back now. Like, so get your ass up there. Yeah. yeah. But again, th this went on the entire movement and the, the Sergeant major was just absolutely out of his mind. Oh my pissed. God. I can't imagine. But, but super professional, like he, he didn't lead on he wasn't vocal. He was just observing. Right. Sure. Sure. And so we get to the, uh, the, uh, MSS where we're going to set up for that night, which is on the top of the mountain. And the Sergeant major and the commander were staying at the bottom because uh, the Sergeant major was in charge of resupply. So he wouldn't be there when the bird came in to make sure that all went off well. And so, uh, Kyle and, and this other guy, got up to the top of the mountain to start digging the foxholes and getting stuff squared away up there. And so I went up to the commander, Sergeant Major. I'm like, Hey gentlemen, uh, first thing I want to do is apologize for, for my teammates, you know, lack of performance. Um, it's an embarrassment to, to, to us, United States military. Uh, and I said, if it's all right with you two gentlemen, I'd like to get them on this resupply bird and, and get them back to the rear. And they're like, 
absolutely. Uh, let's, let's do that. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not in the game of apologizing for the behavior and performance of other human beings, but, you know, one thing that our profession kind of throws you into is, is oftentimes you, you are either the only Air Force dude on the team uh, or, you know, you're, you're one of a, a very small handful. Right. And so you have to recognize that you're not just representing yourself, you're representing, you know, our career field, you're representing the United States Air Force, you're representing uh, the DOD. Yeah. And, you know, and, and certainly when we're operating with our, our coalition partners, uh, that's even more apparent, right? That's so, what I was going to uh, say. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not even like you were with the army at this time. You're like, you're with another country who's like, yeah. you know, regardless of who they've worked with in the past. I mean, you're, you are representing the U S at that point. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. So, uh, so they, they agreed with that course of action. Um, I, I ran up the mountain and it, it just, uh, share this. So I get to the top of the mountain, this guy, He's got, uh, his, he dumped his ruck. He's, he took his top off. So he's shirtless. You know, this is a big bodybuilder white dude yeah. standing at the, the crest of a mountaintop in, in the middle of the day. So I'm like, in bad guy country. I mean, it's, it's not country. It's Afghanistan in 2002. So it's not yeah. safe at all. Yeah. yeah. And to make it matters worse. He's, uh, cause you know, back then we had the, the liter and a half plastic bottles of water. That was your, yep. the water that you carried. He's standing there with his shirt off and it's, it's all good. You know, I think it was June, July is hot. Right. Yeah. And he's, he's literally, he's pouring the water onto his arms and I'm, I, I walk up on this. I'm like, I won't use the language that I use with him, but basically I was like, pack your shit get your ass back down the hill. Like you're out of here on this bird. Yeah. As soon as it comes in birds inbound and be here in 30 minutes. Uh, let's go. And, you know, he, he started to kind of, you know, push back. I'm like, this is not open for debate. Like you're, you're out of here. And so, yeah. um, so he packed his shit. I walked him back down the mountain, put him on the bird and, uh, and uh, saw him probably 45 days later when Kyle and I got out of the field and he's sitting in the ASOC uh, in the air conditioning, crushing food, uh, having the time of his life. So, you know, and, sure and that you probably did both of you guys a favor, like you did the Marines a favor by getting him out of yeah. there. But, you, it, you know, it, it's combat's not for everybody and that kind of life is not for everybody and he he probably thought that's what he wanted at some point but then uh, as you can see he he probably bit off way more than he wanted to chew and you probably did that guy a favor by getting him out of there it, you probably saved his life and the lives of the marines around him frankly yeah certainly um i think unfortunately there are people that are drawn to whether it's our community or, or other special warfare communities uh solely for the purpose of, of being able to say that they're a part of that community. Yeah. Um, and, and, but they're not willing to do the things that are required in order to continue to earn their place there. Right. Uh, and be, and be assets instead of liabilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, we could debate whether that's a, a standard issue that, that allows humans like that to, to make it through. Uh, but I, I've seen it, you know, more often than I'd like to admit where, you know, dudes, you know, make it and then they just, they go on cruise yep. and, and they're not willing to put forth the effort that is required, in my opinion, to, to maintain uh, and, and be a good standing member of that community. Uh, so he certainly fell within that category. I think he was more concerned about being uh, affiliated with uh, an organization or, or a career field such as ours, rather than yeah. uh, exercising the discipline uh, to maintain a high level of competence and confidence and the physical ability to do it. Right. And like I said before, that I mean, that that's kind of dangerous, but, or not kind of, it, it frankly is dangerous. I mean, that you get a guy who just wants to wear the beret or just wants to tell, you know, the people at the bar that he's a tech P and then yeah. he gets in combat and he's a liability. And that's just, 
that's what that's what bugs me the most about it. It's like, look, I, I, I don't care what you do. I don't care what you want to do. Just don't put friendlies in danger. You know, that's all I care about. So, yeah. 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 You like yeah, I said, you did the right thing, man. You, he, he needed someone to like you to tell him this really isn't for you. I mean, you ought to probably do something else. So, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know what happened to him after that. Um, quite frankly, I don't care. Uh, all right. But I, I, I was just concerned about you know him putting the entire company at risk Definitely. Uh, based on his lack of physical ability and, and will. So, so, so yeah, you guys are out there um, for 45 days. That was, that's crazy. That's a long time to be out. Yeah. So Kyle and I, um, we, we stayed with the Brits until they, they redeployed, uh, later that summer into summer. So we, we ended up actually splitting. And so after we, we exfilled with a whiskey company back to Balad just to refit, recover. And then we got, uh, I got tasked out to Zulu company, which was at the time, one of their mounted companies. And I was with Zulu for probably another four weeks or so, at least maybe more. Uh, Kyle went with, I think he was with Yankee company and then uh, came back out of the field with, with Zulu. We, we'd driven all the way back up north to, to Balad. I got tasked over to, to Yankee Company, uh, went back out, which is a dismounted company, uh, went back out in the field with the, those guys for another few weeks. And so it was just a really great time uh, for me. Again, I, I learned a ton. My field skills, you know, you know, just shot really high in terms of uh, competence, uh, and got to do a lot of cool things with, with those guys. And again, I, I, I can't say enough goodness about uh, the British Royal Marines, man. Like, like those guys are legit and, yeah. and they are professional war fighters, but in every sense of the word. So, um, so wait, so you were, it was 2002 or you, yeah, you went to Balad? Yeah. That, well, that, that's where the main kind of our main staging uh, base was the, the Brits had their little camp there. Okay. And so we, we would just go back and forth to Balad just to refit and recover and then I push back out in the field. Okay. Which um, we primarily operated in the, the Southeast al- along the border. Okay. So then, so you supported those guys. Any, did you get, get any scrapes and when you're with the Marines or was it pretty uneventful or? It was pretty uneventful, man, to be honest with you. I, I'd say when, when I was with Zulu company, we, we had a pretty significant, uh, find we were cruising doing presence patrol in this village uh we, we happened to come a, a bunch of dudes on motos running around look suspicious did some investigating and uh, we ended up finding this massive weapons cache in this compound so um we we hit that compound kind of a hasty uh hit on that compound um i think we we got one, there was one guy that put up a fight in there. Um, but once we got in there, cleared it, we, and then we started, you know, really understanding like exactly what we had just found. It was, it was pretty significant. And so once the bad guys realized that we had just, uh, captured their massive weapons cache, and I'm talking like several tons of weapons and ammunition and RPGs and mines and, literally everything that you can think of was in this compound. And so, uh, and that was just one troop that, uh, that had, had, we had hit that, that place. And so we yeah. were merely set up defense on, on that compound, uh, to coordinate how we were going to, you know, extract all of this, uh, back to, uh, we actually got it back to, uh, Bob to coast He's Bob Chapman is where we actually, ended up taking it to, but so that's, what I was ta- that's what I was talking about before. So when you say Balad, do you, do you mean Bagram? Oh, I'm sorry. Bagram. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, um, I'm like, what year totally are we in right now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I Cause I was like, I mean, I, I'm not yeah. the smartest guy around, but I'm like, yeah, yeah. so what year is this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just want to clarify okay. for, cause I no, know you're... there's anybody who's listening to this. They're like, what the, he's not t- Balad. What's he talking about? So I just want to clarify yeah. before yeah, we go yeah. for, yeah. go for yeah, the, no Everything's blurred together. I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. For sure. Believe me, I know. I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, but just, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, anyway, so we, we, um, there, we had some probes that night from, from the enemy trying to retake, uh, that weapons cache that, uh, Oh really? I was, yeah, I was, able, it wasn't anything in my opinion, it wasn't anything super serious, but for me, you know, first deployment, you know, again, I'm like, yeah, dude, like, let's, this is, this is awesome. Uh, and then, you know, so I, I'm pushing up requests for, for air support just to kind of, just in case we needed it. Uh, initially when we hit that compound, um, uh, there, w- there weren't any cast assets overhead, but for the, the only thing they could push me was, was like an E3 and, or, or, or P3, I'm sorry, P3 Viking. And which is a Navy yeah, airplane. Yeah. It, it doesn't have any weapons on it. Right. And, uh, but I was like, okay, well, I mean, I can, I guess we can do some shows of force and, and whatnot. And so, uh, that, that seemed to be effective, uh, until we, I got some, some stuff overhead that actually had some munitions on it. But, um, okay. Yeah, it was, it, it was froggy for about 15 minutes and then we got everything sorted out. And nice. after that, it was just a matter of, matter of figuring out how we're going to load all of this stuff uh and get it back to to chapman so that's what we did and so obviously my, my role there during that convoy long movement was to provide armed uh, reconnaissance with uh aircraft overhead so on a bit full convoy got everything back there all good to go nice. so yeah it's funny you mentioned that like it at that time uh anytime an aircraft would fly over the bad guys would scatter they were like i don't because they don't know what it is so yeah you could it yeah. could be a p3 or whatever and as long as it was flying low enough and they could hear it then they're gonna stop yeah. doing what they're doing yeah that's pretty nice yeah, yeah. the other thing too uh, it, it was during the daytime when we we found that compound and we we hit it um and i didn't so i had a bs-17 panel obviously but it, it wasn't and again a p3 isn't a closer support you know, right asset so, but they're just trying to help out, right? And so, I'm trying to talk them onto our position, <clears throat> give them the, the coordinate, and um, they couldn't see my panel. They couldn't pinpoint, you know, this one particular mud compound in the middle of everything else. So, All right. I what I did was I I was kind of rummaging around the compound, and I, I found a bunch of uh, blankets, like, like super colorful blankets, and. So I grabbed a, just a big armful of them. I ran back up on the rooftop and I, I oriented them uh, in to magnetic north and, and just made a, a north seeking arrow with all nice. these massive blankets on top of the rooftop. And, and they were able to see that. And so that, that was kind of a, you know, feel expedient way to kind of solve that problem of getting, yeah, that's awesome. You know, visual friendlies with a, an asset that doesn't do close air support. So, um, I just share that story, you know, for, for guys out there that are, you know, you know, be creative, you know, look at what you got around you, uh, do the best with what you got and, and always, always be critically thinking on how to, to solve problems. So, right. Yeah. I mean, it's combat. So there, there are no, really there are no rules to anything i mean you you do yeah. what you're trained to do you do the procedural stuff first all your ttps but if that stuff's not working i mean it's it's yeah. your life i mean you got you know you can do you got to think outside the box and get and do some stuff that's going to work for you for sure yeah that's awesome how long were you over there that time in afghanistan i think we we're over there like four or five months not that long okay and you redeployed back to the 13th and then yeah yep. go from there tell, tell me what happened after that yeah, redeployed, and then uh, let's see, 2003. Obviously, uh, OIF was kicking off. I was still with 18 Infantry, Third Brigade, Fourth Infantry Division. Um, I had submitted a package to go uh, to the to the soft side after that deployment, and and so they moved me over to our flight that supported 10 Special Forces Group, and so nice. Uh, leading the fall of 2002, fall winter of 2002, uh, I was over there with with the 10th group guys and started to integrate there in, in that flight and in, in, in that mission. And then uh, 4th ID got the the call to start prepping for Iraq. And the squadron at the time, we 
our manning levels, we were going to have a gap in, in JTACs to support 4th Infantry Division. So uh, the decision was made to, to pull me back um, from 10th Group back to support uh, my, my previous battalion okay. on the conventional side. And so that, that, you know, it sucked, but at the end of the day, it's like, Hey man, like I'm going to do whatever's required, uh, you know, where, wherever I'm needed, that's where I'm going to go serve. So sure. um, came back to the commercial side, did all the, the pre-deployment train up with, with our battalion, uh, all the planning and, and all that stuff that goes into um, uh, moving a, a massive army unit uh, like that to combat, you know, we were involved with, uh, we got kind of, you know, I say kind of, we, we got screwed. Fourth infantry got screwed out of the, the big fight because we were originally supposed to come down from the North through Turkey uh, and, and be the, the Northern front, uh, at least from a conventional perspective, yeah. which was going to be a, a pretty good fight as, as obviously the, the guys on the, on the SF side, uh, found out but uh at the last minute you know history turkey said no we're not going to allow you to to transit through turkey to invade iraq and so all the the ships that had our our uh you know bradley's tanks 113s all of our gear had to sail all the way around and offload in kuwait Jeez. so that obviously delayed our deployment several weeks and so we ended up flying into kuwait and it was absolute chaos trying to find you know not only our humvees but our 113 down at the port yeah, yeah. Uh, get all that and then push up to the the northern camps in, in northern kuwait um and then prep to go over the the border uh and so uh, again by the time we got all of our our shit together uh, you know, obviously, Third ID and the Marines had had done a lot, of, most of the heavy fighting, uh, right. pushing up from the south, and so we just kind of fell in behind their efforts and, and kind of did some cleanup. And so our our first, I would say, mission uh, with with on the convention with One Eight Infantry was uh, we we offloaded. It was kind of funny because we we rolled into combat in, in Iraq. Um, with all of our stuff loaded up on the back of semi trailers because we didn't have the confidence that we, that all of our equipment could make the, could, dri could make it all the way to Baghdad. Just oh, really? on its own. Jeez. So it is kind of like a clown show because, you know, we, I was in me and, and two of my romance at the time, uh, and the FSO, we were in our, our one, one, three, which is loaded on the back of a, a semi truck flatbed along with other, you know, everything, the entire battalion was, was loaded up on the back of semi trailers. Yeah. It's this massive long convoy and, and we're just like, so you guys sitting. are in, in your vehicle on top of the semi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was so, it was so silly. Yeah. And so we, we drive, we drive like that all the way from Kuwait to the South end of Baghdad and we offload right at the south end of Baghdad. Like, it's like, okay, guys, now let's let's get our combat helmets on and yeah. now we're really here. And so we drove into to Baghdad uh, and thank God my my track driver, uh, Army Specialist, he was, a, he was a 113 mechanic, which was absolutely a godsend because, yeah. you know, typical, uh, not to knock the Army, but, you know, uh, the army provides a, a lot of support for us and, uh, they gave, they gave me and, and our team, the, the oldest M113 in the battalion, right. right. Know, like predated Vietnam. Oh my and, God. and so we're driving through Baghdad and it was getting dark and we, we had the big jerk 206 comp pallet mounted inside the track. Right. Right, and I'm right. up there at a TC and, you know, on ICS and, and monitoring the radios. And, um, I noticed that I'm not hearing anything and I look down and the inside is completely dark and I'm like, what the hell? And so I like tap my driver on the, on the head and I'm like, dude, there's no power. And he's, so he's looking around. He's like, oh yeah. And so he's basically like, he's like, Hey, 
he's yelling at me as we're driving. He's like, okay, pull off the access hatch that's inside uh, to the engine compartment. And then there's this, there's this one plug that sits on top of the uh, engine block. It yeah. basically goes to the alternator and the generator. And he's like, just wiggle that, that plug. <laughs> and, <it. laughs> and so I'm like, okay. So <laughs> I, I duck back in, in the track. I pull this, this big steel access panel off the back of the, the engine compartment. And, uh, and I, I got my red light flashlight in there. And if you've ever seen that game of uh, Operation, you know, yeah, like yeah, school game Operation, yeah, you're trying to get shit out of there. Imagine that, but there's you know belts and fans and all this other shit spinning in there. Oh my god! And I gotta, I gotta reach in there and <laughs> not get my arm ripped off and wiggle this oh plug that's sitting on top of the engine uh, block. And it, but as soon as I did, man, like power came on. And really? Came back on, I'm like, yeah. So. That was just one of many stories where our, our, our track broke and we were in the battalion would leave us. They're like, okay, well, whenever you guys get your shit fixed, like catch up. So, but luckily our, our, our driver was uh he was a, a mechanic guru. Yeah. How lucky that dude could fix anything, man. And so, uh, yeah, it was an interesting time. For yeah. Sure. How was stories. that deployment? What do I mean? Was everything pretty much done when you got there or did you, take any you know i mean I, I heard people were like i know third id would just blow through built up areas trying to get to baghdad so and then a lot of guys would come in behind them and they they get in some scrapes because you know the people that they left behind obviously they didn't clear that whole area so yeah did you find any of that or, or was it pretty much done by the time you guys got there since you had to go all the way around you couldn't go through yeah Turkey, so i'd like to say that we we got in the shit man but we hit we didn't man it was <laughs> I, we were all pretty disappointed. Like pretty much our battalion's mission was to go and clear airfields. So okay. the, the next morning we get through Baghdad, the next morning we went and cleared Taji uh, airfield, which is just on the North side of Baghdad. So that was our, our kind of our first battalion mission was to clear Taji. And uh, on the North side of Taji was uh, the, the Iraqis had this big weapons depot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had fun blowing that up. And right. It was like Fourth of July, watching all that stuff go off. Uh, nice. And then the next, the next mission was, and, and I'll get this one correct now. We we went and cleared Balad. <laughs> right. And now it was Balad. Okay, good. Yeah, then we were <laughs> we were. I was actually at Balad. Uh, so we we cleared Balad, and which again had already we'd bombed the shit out of the air airfield uh, yeah, early yeah. on. Uh, it had been cleared once. Uh, but we had gone through there and, and just kind of did some, some mop up, uh, super, you know, vanilla pretty much. And then we just yeah. continued to, to, to get tasked with, with that sort of operation. So after Balad, uh, we went up to, uh, to crit, uh, there was an airfield up there. Uh, we stayed in to crit for maybe a two or three weeks. Um, you know, it's kind of doing some presence and clearance and into crit then we pushed up to kirkuk we were in kirkuk for a while and then came back down south went to samara east airfield we we're based out of there for a little while and just kind of conducting some random um you know missions and whatnot and then pushed out kind of east over towards the iranian border um, and did some, you know, again, just kind of presence patrols and just kind of figuring out the, the lay of the land out there. And then eventually the battalion and the brigade ended up back at, at Balad and then third brigade used that, used Balad as, as their headquarters location. Um, and so that's kind of where we ended up several months later. It's probably July ish. We got back to, to Balad and that's, that's kind of where we stayed for the remainder of, of that deployment, which uh, I, I volunteered to stay uh, longer because the, the Air Force decided uh, they would they would give you short tour credit, you know, if you stayed longer than six months uh, downrange. So I was like, and it really the only selfishly I did that because I didn't want to go to Korea. Right, uh, right, right. And so, yeah. so I was like, man, I'll, I'll stay here. And so. Uh, 
I, I came back in late October, 2002, um, uh, from, from Iraq. Nice. So, um, so then you, uh, okay. So you came back from there. Did they let you go back to the soft side or what, what happened after that? Yeah. So they did. And then I, I mentioned early on that I, I wasn't always the model airman and, All right. uh, I'm going to share this story because I, I want people to, I want to reinforce just how critical it is uh, for leaders uh, to, to see potential in human beings. And even if they make mistakes and those mistakes at times could be pretty serious, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you, if you were just to put your trust and confidence that they're going to learn from this lesson, uh, more often than not, they'll, they'll, turn their lives around and be successful. So, so yeah, got back from, um, Iraq in late 2003 and I had, uh, I'll, I'm just going to be straight up candid and, and, and honest with everybody. There's no sense of sugarcoating it. So I brought back some, I clandestinely, uh, brought back some war trophies. Okay. And long story short, uh, I, I don't recommend doing that. Uh, yeah. because eventually you're, you're, you're going to get caught. And so I got caught. It's obviously a big deal. Yeah. And, and so I had to, I had to answer for, for my actions. And so that, that ended up being, um, at the end of the day, I, I got off extremely lucky. And so yeah. I, I ended up getting article 15. Um, I got my, I had made tech sergeant. Uh, I got my tech sergeant stripe taken away. Oh, no way. Right, or, Wait, or had I you sewn it on already or were you had a line number? No, I, I had a line number. Okay. I, I shouldn't say I got it taken away. I, I, my actions, uh, drove that decision. So it yeah. was on me. Uh, so article 15, uh, lost my E6 line number. Uh, and then I had a six month suspended bust. If uh, I did anything else stupid that would have busted me down to senior airman and I was on a control roster and uh, a bunch of other stuff. So, yeah. um, and, and it was all justified. Right. And, sure. and quite frankly, again, I, I got lucky. I, my commander could have easily said, man, like, dude, you, you really screwed up and we're going to go to court martial. Like that, that was, and, and he, and quite honestly, he, he was getting a lot of pressure, uh, to go down that route. Right. And, yeah. and we talked about it earlier, right? Like, unfortunately leaders get, get, there's a term for it. It's called undue command influence. Uh, we like to say it doesn't happen, but it happens. Oh, but he, sure. he was getting a tremendous amount of pressure, uh, to throw the book at me and he wouldn't have been wrong for doing yeah. so, uh, based on my actions. Uh, but, uh, he saw something in me. Um, he had some, some confidence that, that I would learn from this mistake, uh, that I would be a better person by, by learning from this mistake instead of, you know, throwing me in jail, which is easily what he could have done. Yeah. Uh, so. And plus he saw that you were a good troop. I mean, that's, and that, that's yeah. kind of where all that stems from. It's like good guys make mistakes. I mean, we're all fallible. So, um, yeah, yeah he saw that you were a stellar troop. You made a, a poor judgment call. You know, he's not yeah. going to, he felt that keeping you in was going to be a better, not only for yourself, for him, but for the air force, you know, the army, whoever, it, it would have been a better thing for you to stay in than to get rid of you for sure. Yeah. So that's a testament to you, man. I mean, I think that's, you know, I think you saw something in you. So, yeah, yeah. I don't disagree with that. I think what, what helped me in that regard is, is up to that point, I, I had conducted myself, uh, with the high level of professionalism and, and competence, which, which gained me some credibility, sure. um, in, in, in our unit and, and outside of the unit, uh, I'd performed well up to that point operationally, uh, across two different deployments. I represented the, the unit and the, the air force, uh, well up to that point. Right. So I think, sure. you know, I, I built up a, a decent amount of, of credibility in, in, in that account, uh, which certainly helped me. I, um, going through that situation. But, um, again, I, I had to, and, and also, you know, again, as I reflect on it, uh, and I, I've matured a lot since then, 
uh, though that also kind of was stoking my ego. Right. And so, you know, I, I was allowing my ego to say, oh man, you know, I, I can get away with this. And You're untouchable. Yeah. It's yeah. untouchable. Right. And so that, that's a pitfall that I think a lot of guys, um, fall into it's like you're you know your teflon take man like nothing can can touch you uh and that, that's it you're gonna get burned man right um and it's it's due to in my case my own actions and so i i i use that uh i didn't recognize it at the time but i certainly do now like that that was that was the catalyst that i needed uh to gain to regain uh, a good bit of humility uh and check my ego and say man like your shit does stink and you're right. not the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, and so, so in that regard, I was, I was grateful that, uh, even though that experience sucked, um, you know, I put myself in that position and mm -hmm. I had to take personal responsibility for it. And again, I was fortunate enough to have leadership that, that saw something in me, despite my, my failure, uh, and my poor decision-making and, and gave me another chance. Yeah, I think that's a good I'm glad you brought that up because a lot like I said, a lot of us went through the similar situations and it kind of it's twofold. Number one, it, it, it tells a guy who's otherwise stellar if they make a mistake. It's not the end of the world. I mean, yeah, you take your licks, you, know, you may get an article 15, you may get a stripe taken away, but that don't let that keep you down. Keep moving forward. Keep trying to excel. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, don't get discouraged, I guess. And then the other side is. If you are one of those stellar troops and you come into a situation where you have you it's decision time to whether you're gonna do the right or the wrong thing, do the right thing. Don't make that poor decision thinking you're gonna be, you know, getting out of it scot free just because you're a, a stellar troop. Because it may go the other way. You may get a commander that just wants to hammer you oh, and yeah. doesn't matter what you're doing. So yeah, just it's always a, it's always the best practice to do the right thing. You know, even when no one's looking, just do the right thing and don't don't try to don't try to get away with things. You know I mean? It's, it's yeah. So yeah, hundred sure. percent. And, um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough recently I, I've been, uh, I, I was given that commander's contact info. So, uh, my intent is to, to reach out to that guy on a personal level and, nice. and just thank him for, for his leadership and, and his, his trust in me. Uh, because again, man, like there's no way I'd be sitting here today All had right. he made a, a different decision. So, Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll speed through a couple other things. So, uh, to your question, did I go soft after my 2003 Iraq, uh, deployment? Uh, yes, I started to, that incident happened, set that back, uh, right, a year. Right. And so it wasn't until 2004 where I was, again, I had to, I had to rebuild that, that credibility with my chain sure. of command. Um, and, and I did so, uh, it took me a year. And so in 2004, uh, I was, I was allowed to resubmit, uh, to go to, to the soft side of the house. Uh, I was, I was fortunately selected to do so. Nice. And so I made the official transition over to, um, support 10th special forces group in, uh, 2004. And, uh, and then I quit, I deployed not too long after that. Uh, in 2005, back to Afghanistan, uh, and I was with uh, 3rd Special Forces Group um, uh, 136 at the time. Okay. And we were at uh, Shkin Fire Base, again, down in the southeast portion of Afghanistan. Super small fire base, um, you know, about five kilometers from the border. And um, really great team, um, super competent. Um, I, we, we didn't really get into a lot of stuff. Uh, it was just, again, a lot of kind of presence patrols and interdicting, you know, rat lines coming across the border, that sort of thing. You know, mm -hmm. we, we did have a couple, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell this story cause I think it's relevant, uh, to our community. Uh, when we talk about, you know, as a JTAC, you know, you, you the expectation is that you're a joint fires expert. And so right. joint fires, uh, isn't just constrained to close air support. Um, from, from aircraft, whether that's fixed wing or a uh, close combat attack from rotary wing. It means that you need to be, you know, Johnny on the spot with any and all fire support options uh, that are available to you. So 
in our case there in 2005 at Schien, we had a platoon of, of 105s there at our fire base. Nice. Uh, conventional guys from 82nd, they were awesome, uh, highly competent uh, artillerymen. And so uh, I immediately, you know, built a very strong relationship with those guys. Uh, we rehearsed uh, fire missions, you know, if not daily, uh, no less than a weekly cadence. Nice. Um, and so, and then we would, we, we began to, to uh, establish pre-planned targets uh, throughout our, our AO. And so we were prepping for, we were conducting a, like a three to four day uh, reconnaissance patrol along the border. And so we had done a lot of mission planning. Um, we were restricted at that time. I think it's, it might, you know, you, you couldn't, you couldn't bring uh, U.S. or coalition fixed wing aircraft within five nautical miles of the border. Right, right. Just a buffer, right. And so obviously at that standoff at that time, uh, based on the, the targeting pods that most of the aircraft were, were carrying at the time, this is 2005, they were, they were limited. And so five nautical mile slant range at a given altitude, you're not getting a lot of fidelity, right, from, right. from the pods at that time. So CAS aircraft in support of that particular mission wasn't necessarily, um, you know, worthy. Uh, obviously, yeah. if we were troops in contact, you could bust that buffer, but that's kind of the going in planning factor. And so with, with that in mind, like, okay, we, we need to have some artillery uh, support that's super dialed in. Uh, we have high levels of confidence and we did so because of the, the level of rehearsal and training that we had done uh, prior. So, so we get out there and uh, it's, it's myself, the team leader and the senior uh, Bravo weapon sergeant. And we have our, our Indig uh, Afghan commando force with us. And, right. and we get up there and, uh, set up our OPs and, and everything the first night. And if you've ever worked with Indige Force, um, I, I love them all, but there's just a <laughs> lack of discipline a lot of times, yeah. Yeah. whether it's, it's light or noise or just general buffoonery. Yeah. And so, you know, they were making a lot of noise and, and whatnot. And uh, we, the three Americans, we, we, we collectively made a decision like, man, this is, let's send these guys back to the MSS, which where the rest of our team was at with the vehicles yeah. about 5k away. Uh, so we made that decision the very next morning. So they head down the mountain back to the MSS. And so it's just, now it's just me, the team leader and the senior Bravo that remain behind. And as after they left the, the mountaintop, we were going to go hole up and, uh, remain over day site. And as we were moving to that location, there were, there were two kids that came up the mountain and, uh, they didn't, in, they didn't let on that they, that they, they saw us, but I, I you could kind of tell it like they were, they were savvy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they got within probably, you know, 30 meters of us. And as soon as we saw them, we, you know, we stopped trying to you know, get behind some rocks or whatever. Yeah. But as I look back on it, I think they probably knew that we were there. But even though they didn't let on, they, they continued up the mountain, basically where our OP was the night before. Yeah. So fast forward, you know, to that evening, and we're about 400 meters away from our previous OP the night before. It had just gotten dark, and uh, the OP that's about 400 meters above us uh, just got lit up with heavy machine gun, uh, and RPG fire. And, and so there's just the three of us and we're like, okay, well, there's clearly some dudes around us, uh, you know, conducting recon by fire, trying to find us. Right. And so now we're at this point, um, of, you know, about, you know, it's just three of us. Right. And so yeah. we're, we're going to be outnumbered. Uh, more than likely. So now we're starting to start to bound, bound our way back to our MSS, which is 5k away. And, um, and we were kind of down in, in the valley. And so as we started to move <clears throat> back, uh, we started taking, there's a second element that was down in the valley with us that 
also started the reconnaissance by fire. And so now we, we definitely knew that we were outnumbered. And yeah. so we just started to, you know, expeditiously bound back. Uh, obviously we, we called the MSS, let them know what was going on. Yeah. And so they, they mounted up, started moving towards us uh, to try to close that gap as quickly as we could. So for me, right. So go back to the, um, the pre-planning. Uh, I, I had, we'd already set up all these pre-planned artillery targets <clears throat> around. Uh, and so I just started calling them up like, Hey, you know, fire alpha, alpha one zero zero three. Uh, and because we had done so much rehearsal, we had registered the guns and we had dialed those things in, but yeah. they, you know, artillery is not a, a precision weapon, but <laughs> no. you're, those guys were, were on it, man. And so nice. basically, you know, as, as we bounded back, you know, I, I would call in, uh, artillery, you know, at our previous locations and kind of cover our way out until we, we got linked up with our MSS. So that's awesome. Um, so that, that was, uh, I, I share that story again, because, you know, as JTAX or, you know, joint fires experts, like, uh, you know, make sure that, that you're using all the arrows in your quiver uh, right. and not just solely focusing on, on one or the other. And it's certainly, uh, I've seen this too. If, if you're not, humans are, are inherently lazy creatures. And so <laughs> if we're not really good at something, uh, most of the time we avoid doing those things. And yep. so I've, I've seen this in our career field where, you know, guys, uh, for whatever reason, they, they're just not comfortable calling in artillery. Mm -hmm. So they tend to avoid, that uh, competence, and so right. uh, that that's an example of not you know not trying to toot my own horn, but just I was using all the assets that we had available to us uh, in the most effective manner that I knew how. So in that no, particular yeah. case, it worked out. Yeah, I don't think that's tooting your own horn. I think that's that's good, you know, solid planning. I mean, I think you like you said, you used all the assets you had at your disposal. No aircraft were going to get close enough to do you any good right. in a timely manner, especially like that. But man. Right. That's that's awesome. That's that's awesome. You had those TRPs already set up, and you just got to yep. call them in. You don't have to do any. As a matter of fact, you probably didn't have, even have to do really a call for fire or yep. any kind of adjustment. I mean, you guys are yeah. bounding back anyway. That's awesome. That's yeah, good. yeah, it worked out. Worked out. Nice. Good, good deal. Yeah. So that that was a good um, that was a good deployment. Uh, uh, that deployment. Here's the other thing I, I kind of saw in my career. It's like, uh, and go back to the Rambo analogy. Like you, you're, you're doing your thing, uh, and, and you think that you're at that point I was with, you know, was it within special operations supporting army special forces? And I was like, man, this is awesome. Like, this is, this is the tip of the spear, man. And, and then you, you, you see other people, you see hey, uh... other teams and you're like, man, who are those dudes? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you're like, well, how do I, how do I go? how do I get to become one of those guys or go be able to go do that? And, uh, so that deployment, uh, 2005, it was, it was, it was cool and it was weird at the same time. So, uh, I was in the gym one day working out in our, our prison gym and there's this, this dude walks by, you know, long beard, all that sort of stuff. I'm like, man, that guy looks familiar. And so there was another team, uh, there was an o Omega, on on skin at the time so yeah um, i don't know if you want to go into what omega teams are but basically that um they're, they're teams that uh within joint special operations command that that uh work with uh, other government agencies uh, yep. let's leave it at that and so uh, i went over to their compound and i think i was asking them for if they had any old uh drop zone surveys because th that was another part of my duties and responsibilities was to to coordinate and control of our uh airdrop resupplies um whether it's chow or 105 ammunition and so i went over there and to ask them if they had any dz surveys that at least i could reference uh before i, I did a new one yeah and i go in there in their talk and and i see the same dude again and um and they were kind of standoffish, you know, they're, but they were helping me out. And, um, and I just asked them a question. I'm like, Hey man, do you happen to be from, uh, did you ever live in Missouri? And as soon as I said that we both kind of recognized each other and it was Not one really. of the, my, 
my buddies from high school. What? Uh, Come on. Yeah. yeah that was, oh, uh, my God. Yeah, so he was a SEAL. And um, and so immediately, like, dude, this is crazy, man. And so <laughs> That is. Yeah, so it, it was kind of <laughs> cool to, you know, small world type of thing. No doubt. Uh, uh, but, you know, he, he was a part of that organization. And that was kind of my first time of, of really – understanding that man there's different levels of this game right um and i'm you know and so that that was intriguing to me yeah, and yeah. so uh so after that deployment um again in 2005 i, I remained at a 10th group uh i deployed again in 2007 early 2007 for the the surge in iraq back to iraq so i was with um deployed with 10th group but there was a it was kind of a combination of, of 10th group and i was with uh charlie one one which is uh the first group uh sif team okay uh they're in baghdad it was their first combat deployment um to iraq anyway and so that was a great team man uh c11 uh not just that company but the team i was with was just which is phenomenal yeah uh, super capable proficient uh SF guys. And so now for those who don't know, go, say kind of describe what a SIF team does. Like what they're, they're, they're SF, but they're, they're not quite the highest level, but they're like up there. They're pretty, they're pretty square. Like what, how would you describe a SIF team or a SIF company? Yeah. So SIF, um, so they, they call it the CRIF now, but back in the day it was called the SIF. So commanders and extremist force. Now it's the yeah. contingency response force, but change the name, the same sort of mission. So basically if you have a, uh, a, a special forces group within that group, you're going to have it at one company specifically dedicated towards uh, immediate contingency response uh, and predominantly so that they'll have uh, much more training in, in direct action and special reconnaissance yeah. and, and things like that. And so um, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say that they're better. It's just different in that they get more specially training. trained, maybe more than, specially trained. Right. Yeah. And like so, a green beret has a, a, a wide array of skills they have to maintain. Whereas right. like once they, if they get on a SIF team, it's more specialized, I guess. Is maybe right. What, exactly. Yeah, okay. And, and the, there's other courses that, um, USASOC has, uh, you know, Sephardic being probably the, the predominant ones that, that all mm -hmm. SIF, uh, SF guys go through, um, before being assigned to a yeah, SIF yeah. company. So obviously super squared away, switched on dudes, uh, highly competent, uh, and proficient, uh, great leadership, uh, from yeah. a team leader and team starting perspective, all the guys were just awesome. So I was, uh, I was attached to those guys, but we had uh, first group there. We had uh, a 10th group team there. And I think there's like four teams and we, and we were based out of Biop, So Baghdad international airport at the area of four, which is the commando area for the Iraqi uh, counterterrorism force. And that was our partner force. Okay. Uh, both the Iraqi counterterrorism force and the Iraqi commandos. That was, those were our two partner forces. And so again, that was during the, the surge in 2007, which was pretty epic in terms yeah. of, you know, the gloves came back off and, and uh, you, we were really able to apply the the level of lethality that the U.S. military is capable of, of doing, yeah. and, and when we're enabled to do that, uh, we can we can achieve some pretty significant results quickly. Um, obviously, you know we do so in a professional, ethical, moral manner, but sure. in terms of you know getting after it. Um, like we, we were enabled to do that and so much so that there were often times where we would, we would do uh, two to three missions a night. Yeah. And, and that was, that, that pace was, was brutal. And cause yeah. it was, it was literally every night um, for seven months. And Jeez. that, that there's, there's, there might be some folks out there saying, ah, oh, it's bullshit. I'm telling you, man, it was, it was, that pace and so yeah. the way that we we ran the cycle was you know there are two basically two week cycles so you're in operational cycle 
a training cycle with your partner force and then uh, a mission planning cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So the teams would rotate through that cycle. But again, go back to you're you're the El Solo Lobo Air Force JTAC. Right. Like you don't get you're not on that rotation. You're <laughs> you stay on operational rotation and you rotate through the teams. Yeah. And so there were there was several nights where uh, I'll give you an example. We 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 went out and conducted a half helicopter assault uh, with one team. We got we we touched back down at, at the compound. Uh, after that mission, go back into the, the jock. The other team was get, was mounting up for a ga ground assault force into Baghdad, grabbed the mission products for that, got the stack from the, the FSO and the jock, and jumped in the truck with them and, and went and did that mission. So oh, God. That, that was an often time, often time recurring kind of battle rhythm. Um, there were, there were two combat controllers there as well. They were assigned to uh, two other teams, mm -hmm. uh, but it was just the just the three of us there, JTAX with uh, with that SIF company, and it was it was it was legit, man. It was it was busy, uh, but again, that's that's what that's what I wanted to do, man. And, right, uh, right. So I, I enjoyed it. I never felt like it was a, a burden, or uh, I didn't want to go. Like man, I was like. I want to go. Matter of fact, it's like a dream come I, true. Yeah. Like this is, this, yeah, this is like what you wanted to do. So it wasn't like, yeah, uh, yeah like you said, it wasn't a, it wasn't hard to <laughs> pony up for that. So yeah. Uh, matter of fact, one night I, I got back from another half and one of the, my other teams that I, I typically would support was getting ready to go out. And one of the combat controllers uh, knew that I was still out. So, so he, he grabbed that mission and as soon as I walked in, I'm like, Hey man, where are you going? He's like, Oh, I'm going with this. Team. I'm like, no, dude, that's, that's my team. And <laughs> I, I appreciate you covering down, but uh, I got it, man. And so, uh, yeah, but the, it, again, the, the team mentality, uh, those guys sure. are great. Uh, it well, that's the thing. I mean, in, in people that are thinking like, uh, oh, you're just trying to do too much. The, the thing about those specialized teams like that, like that combat controller, was probably a squared away guy and he was just trying oh, yeah. to do you a favor because he didn't know if you're going to get back. But if you, if he would have been on that team, that team would have been like, who's this guy? Like, where's Brett? You know, he, Brett's our yeah. guy. We train with Brett. Now we got to figure out what this guy's, you know, if, if he's squared away. Yeah. It's just easier and it's, it's more, it's safer and more effective to have the same guy every time. That way they, you know, you're used to that kind of battle rhythm and that does TTPs and that kind of thing. Yeah, certainly. And, and, those guys, both those guys were super capable as well, and they would have done a phenomenal job. But to your point, it's like when you build that, that relationship with that team uh, and, and you, you spend a lot of time and effort uh, building that credibility based on your performance and, and your deeds, not your words. Um, yeah. You know, it's, you know, there's that level of trust that, that's created sure. there. And uh, so, yeah, but, but certainly we were, uh, the three of us were, or self, you know, we would, we would help each other out as much sure, as we sure. could. So tell me about some, I mean, do any of those specific hits turn, uh, stand out in your mind? Uh, was there one particularly harrowing yeah. one or? Yeah, one was, uh, so this kind of touches on your uh, critical thinking and problem solving. So uh, again, there, there were three of us there assigned to, to that specific mission. Um, and we, we primarily operated in, in Baghdad. And if any, anybody that was over there at the time remembers, you know, uh, 88 Alpha Sierra, that's the, that was the one to 100 map of, of Baghdad. That's, mm -hmm. that was the kill box for Baghdad was 88 Alpha Sierra. Okay. And at the time it was, it was the most, you know, congested airspace in the world, I think, uh, at least that's right. what I was told. And so what that meant was that, uh, anytime that we operated in Baghdad, like we had to be super switched on in terms of our airspace deconfliction oh, yeah. and and understanding where everybody was and uh so we what we devised was this internally was this kind of plan is okay uh this is where my target is this is where yours is this is where your yours is this is the ROS, the restricted operating zone that that accompanies each one of our our targets clearly they're going to overlap and mm -hmm. 
So how the, the, the question then becomes, how do we deconflict? You know, cause I got, I got five aircraft in support of my mission. You got three over there and, and he's got, you know, two over there. And so, right. and, and those are just the aircraft that we're controlling. All right. Um, obviously the, there's, there were other, um, elements out there in Baghdad, uh, doing their own thing that also had aircraft. Mm -hmm. And so we had to, uh, number one, visually represent what those Razas look like on the imagery. And we would do that in Falcon view. And then I, I typically print a, a hard copy with my cargo pocket. And then we, we also, we obviously knew each other's strike frequencies. And so if, and when we, we had to go kinetic, uh, and I, and I would brief this in my, my uh, pre-mission brief to the aircraft. I'm like, hey, man, if, if we go kinetic, I need you or dash two to jump over on this strike freak, which is my teammates, the combat controllers, and, and let him know that we need to clear out our RAS in order to conduct this kinetic strike. Okay. Um, and so, you know, that's the way that, that we handled it at the tactical level. I know that, that the CRC also, you know, played a, a role in, in that stuff as well. But at the tactical level, in the heat of the moment, in a tick, like that's how we, we chose to solve that problem. And it worked out well, man. It was, it was very efficient. It was fast. Um, and so getting back to this one night, we were, we were doing this, uh, hitting all this compound to, to ca kill or capture this guy. And we had conducted a... We, we dismounted our vehicles about two blocks away and we're walking around in the corner to the target building and I'd have had F 16s overhead in support. And so they don't, I'd had, I pushed them over to the target area to start developing, you know, situational awareness of the target before we, we got there. They'd done that. They said, Hey man, there's, there's eight dudes on the roof. Um, look to be sleeping at this point. And so they kept, eyes on them. Uh, we had rounded the corner. They started to stir. They get up and look over the, the side of the, the rooftop and, and immediately start engaging us. And uh, so I was lighting the, the F-16s up to, you know, to, to drop some ordnance on this building. And the, I'll never forget this, man. Lead comes up. He's like, he's like, I'm like, hey, troops in contact, you know, and we had our, our uh, graphic grid reference graphic products. I'm like, hey, you know, it's target building confirmed. I get eight individuals rooftop target building. I see that they got weapon. I see their contact. Yeah. So basically I was lining these these guys up to for a nine line uh, to drop ordinance on this on this target. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then he said, I, I got to go get gas. Oh, no. He left her told him that. Uh, but I had also had an MQ1 Predator. Uh, overhead and support as well. And it was okay. also watching this unfold. And so I'm like, well, shit, I, let's, let's try a hellfire off this MQ one. And so as you can imagine, um, calm delays based on the distance and, and whatnot, it, it was, it was challenging to try to get whoever was flying that thing right uh line lined up for a hellfire shot on this building and there were some geometry problems involved with that based on altitude restrictions and launch acceptability regions of the hellfire and blah 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 okay and and line of sight to the laser energy and, and all these different things they just basically he came in and he was off dry three separate times based on parameters and finally i said hey dude this isn't working uh, I, I popped over, I had him contact my combat control buddy who was in Baghdad, had the gunship. Actually, I, I didn't do that. I jumped on his frequency cause I knew the gunship was going to be on his frequency. Mm -hmm. Told the gunship, Hey, I'm troops in contact on this operation. The other thing that we would do is we would all, we would give all of our mission products to all the aircraft that were going to support all three of us. Smart. So. So they already had them. So I'm like, Hey, I need you to come overhead, establish, you know, your, your wheel over target, this target on this mission. Uh, and so they did that. They got over, uh, quickly and we started putting rounds down on that target. Um, uh, most of the buildings over there were, were, uh, reinforced concrete mm -hmm. rooftops and stuff. So by that time, the bad guys had gone 
internal to the structure. So in my mind, I, I want to mitigate collateral damage, right? And so knowing that uh, I'd been on a lot of rooftops at that point in Baghdad, so I knew the, the composition of, of what it was. So I was like, hey, let's go with 105 delayed fuse. Let's, let's punch through. Let's, you know, try to contain the effects inside of that, that sure. target building. Uh, and so we did that. And, um, you know, we, we neutralized the, the, the target, um, didn't sustain any casualties, uh, reduced that structure to the ground, um, and then unintentionally, you know, set some fires. And uh, so I had to answer for that once we got back to the to the house. And, and But again, this goes back to um, – your, your competence as a joint fires expert, like you need to understand, you know, why you are doing something. And right. in, in my case, the why for, cause the first question is like, well, why'd you use one Oh five? Like, you know, that's way above what you, you needed to use at the time. And I'm like, uh, actually I use one Oh five in order to mitigate collateral damage. Right. Um, if I would have used 40, number one, it's not going to do anything. Uh, it's not going to punch through reinforced concrete. Number two, the forty the the round forty rounds that they were using had the zirconium rings on them, so they were intended to start fires. Mm. And so um, that was, but if if you don't have that level of understanding and competence, then you, you can't, um, you know, you, you can't articulate clearly your decision making. Uh, right. And certainly, you're going to put yourself behind the power curve in the moment in a in a fairly dynamic situation. Um, trying to achieve effects and, and uh, you know, save your teammates while also at the same time uh, reducing the enemy. So it was basically that turned into a, not an investigation, but it was just like had to talk the leadership through why. And and so you, you need to be able to, for all the, the young dudes out there, make sure you have a level of competence that enables you to, to, to do that when the time comes. Yeah, it's not about just killing bad guys. Sometimes you have to explain how and why you killed those bad right. guys. Yeah, especially right. in this day and age. Like at the beginning, not so much. But as the war went on, a lot of lawyers got involved. A lot of you know, um, a lot of people had to answer for what they did. And if you are confident and you're doing the right thing, then you got nothing to worry about. So yeah, keep that in mind yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yes. So that deployment. Uh, ver- I, I still think that was my, my best deployment in terms of uh, ability to to control and employ munitions uh, and, and really do my do the job of a JTAC like yeah a, just a, a lot of uh, closer support employment from from both fixed wing fighters the gunship predominantly a lot of critical thinking to to solve unique problems like some nights. Uh, there just wasn't enough aircraft to go around. So there'd be times when we didn't have anything. And it's like, well, do you just throw your hands up and say, well, I'm sorry, team, there's nothing I can do No, Like you figure out, Hey, what conventional Apache units are conducting area reconnaissance in the area that my operation is going to be conducted? Uh, how, how do I contact those guys, give them my frequency and build a relationship with them so that uh, when there is a gap in coverage based on you know refueling or, or whatever the case may be, I know that I can jump on on their common frequency uh, and and ask them to come over if, if they can to support those gaps in coverage. And so uh, we we did that. I did that several times, um, which was you know again they're more than happy to do it right because they're just sure, kind sure. of cruising around just looking for things. They'd rather be supporting an active you know, direct action mission. So, right. uh, but, but those are the things that, you know, again, I would encourage, you know, the young guys out there to, you know, just don't stop at that first obstacle kind of, you know, think through creative solutions um, so that you're an asset to the team. So yeah, just a a lot of that and and, uh, a lot of exposure to to helicopter assault force operations, you know, setting up uh, helicopter landing zones, uh, making sure that that's all, good to go. It, it's safe. And, you know, your X fill is always a challenge, right. To herd the right. cats and get them in the right spot and, you know, confirm with Sergeant major, we got everybody. And, and, uh, you know, that can go sideways really quick if, if you're not paying attention to what's going on. So 
that was a really good uh, deployment for me uh, to accelerate a lot of skills and experience and things that I hadn't done before on the conventional side. Yeah, to your point, uh, a lot the preparation work, while it seems cumbersome in the beginning, or if you know, for someone who might be a little, I don't want to say lazy, but Putting out that effort ahead of time saves you a lot of work on the back end, like, you know, like you yeah. said, setting up, you know, knowing where the, for instance, setting up TRPs or knowing where these conventional assets are going to be or, set, you know, knowing where the HLZs are going to be in case you have to move from your you know, primary mm-hmm. exfil location. Preparing that before you go out saves you a hell of a lot of ass pain, especially if it's the middle of the night, you might be under fire, yeah. whatever, you know, so just for guys who are listening, it pays dividends to kind of do that preparation work. Yeah. 100%. Okay. So you you were with the SIF, um, and then when you came back, did you do another deployment with the SIF, or did you do something else after that? No. So during that deployment, we had um, the fires NCO that was up at uh, the Siege of Soda, uh, Jock, running fires up there. Uh, Matt Schleich, uh, he yep. was a guy, and so Matt had uh, he he was or he had just left the the twenty fourth STS. And when we were rotating off of that 2007 deployment, you know, coming back through uh, Balad on our way home, uh, Matt pulled me aside one night. He's like, hey, man, you know, I, I watched you during this deployment. You know, you did some good stuff. Uh, I, I really think that you, you should consider putting a package for the 2-4. And I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about, man. Like, <laughs> what, what is that? Yeah. I never heard of it. You know, whatever. And so he, he was one of the fires guys at the two, four for a long time. And, and, uh, he, he kind of gave me the, the skinny and I was like, okay, yeah, whatever, man. Like if, if you've got confidence in my ability to potentially be successful, we like, I, I trust you. And so I got back from that deployment. Um, let's see my spent a little, I, I still was at 10th group out of Carson. Uh, my wife ended up because she was active duty Air Force as well. She's a signals intelligence analyst. Okay. Uh, she actually deployed <clears throat> with uh, with the task force uh, to run all of their signals intelligence wow. in 2008 uh, in Iraq. And nice. so she was running running all the, the task force SIGINT up in Mosul and, and some other areas. Wow, um, cool. Yeah, so so I was back at the time. We had, we had two kids at that point, so... You know, I stayed back while she deployed sure. and it was during that time where I was kind of getting my package together for the two, four. So this would have been, you know, mid to late 2008, I was, uh, doing a lot of training, you know, so go back to, to boot camp, right. And in my failure initially to, to get in the combat control career field based on my, my lack of swimming abilities, right. uh, I knew that, that, you know, we, we still were taking the OPSOC PT test at the time. So I knew that that was uh, going to be a limiting factor for me if I didn't train properly. So I really dedicated uh, myself towards preparing myself physically, uh, maintaining my, my competence and confidence in, in my skill sets as a JTAC, uh, and then just doing, doing everything I could to, to set myself up for success going into uh, assessment, which back in the day, it was – it was different than the way it's conducted now. So I was uh, submitting my package. Uh, I got an invite to come out to uh, Fort Liberty now, right? Right. Uh, it's Fort Bragg <laughs> yeah. in, in February of 2009 for assessment, which back then it was a, it's a week long assessment. And it could, you know, it consisted of <clears throat> first thing was uh, you know, it was like zero four on Monday morning was the PT test there at the, at the Pope track. Mm-hmm. And that was, I think there was maybe seven of us, something like that, seven or eight dudes. Um, the 2 4 commander there, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kurt Buller, was there. Okay. Um, he's a legend in his own yeah. right, phenomenal leader. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story about him. Actually, that happened that week. Uh, so that, that was kind of my first, um, I would say, r- realization of some, that there's something else out there, right? Right. Uh, the fact that uh, a squadron commander would show up 
at a PT test at zero four in the morning and it was like 34 degrees and 15 mile an hour winds, uh, told me that this is, this is just something different that the, the leadership is so invested in coming out here and watching eight dudes run around at the track 12 times, um, and do everything else, uh, was like, I hadn't seen that before. Yeah. Um, uh, I think like this guy me, was definitely interested in who was trying out and he wanted to have a firsthand effect on yeah. you know, who was going to be in his squadron, frankly, later on. Yeah. No, so real quick, let me, this was for, were you assessing for the fire shop? Because I know you did some other stuff later. Yeah. But this initial assessment was just to, to work in the, uh, the fire support shop at the two, four, right? No, no. Oh, so no. on the, on the, back then the, on the, on the old school package, you, you basically, you check the box. Okay. And it's like, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to, uh, you know, for tech P, do you want to be fires or, and then beside that, there's another box that said operator. And I, I oh, checked the operator box. okay, cool, cool, cool. Cause I knew uh, you did that. I just didn't know how, what the, go ahead. I'll let you talk. So maybe if I listen, yeah. would just listen, you could, would tell me what's going on. No, man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what, what gave me a little bit of confidence when, uh, when, when we all showed up at the, at the track for the PT test was there were, there were three guys at the assessment that I was deployed with in 2007 in Baghdad. Nice. Uh, so there's, there was two comic controllers and a special tactics officer. Okay. And, and we had ran into each other in Baghdad and, and we had gotten to know each other. And so when I saw them at the same assessment, I'm like, okay, there's at least I, I know these guys, right. Yeah. From a, a deployed perspective. And, and we had that common experience. And, and so, uh, it, it, it helped in terms of taking a little bit of the edge off knowing that, you know, I deployed with these guys before. And, and so I, I was in the presence of, of good company and, and, um, you know, that I had seen them operate down range. And for me personally, it kind of helped in terms of, putting, let's say them up on this huge pedestal and, and I'm down here, uh, it sort of even the playing field, not to say that they, they weren't phenomenal operators, but it, it, it was more for me for sure. than anything else. Yeah. Just so, boost your confidence level up. Like, Hey, these guys are trying out for the same thing I am. Yeah. Or even. Yeah. So, so we progressed through assessment that week, uh, together. Um, and again, it, that, back then it was, it was a series of, you know, physical, you know, the PT test is kind of, you know, say check that box and make sure you, you're, you're good to pass the minimum standards, uh, on the AppSoc PT test. So, uh, and then there was a very, very in-depth, uh, psychological assessment that you went through. It's called the NEO. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you do some, uh, kind of a monster mash style, uh, round robin skill station events. Uh, which were, that was pretty fun. Yeah. And then a lot of interviews and we did, a. so at the time, uh, Andy Cornelius was the lead fires guy there at the two, four. So him and, uh, Kale Huffman yeah. were there. And so they, they did, they took me out and, uh, set up some, uh, sortie there so I could do some, you know, closer support controlling in, in front of there and so they could observe and, and see how nice. it controlled uh, out in the MOA. So we did that, came back, and then that the assessment uh, back then culminated in your, your board. And so the board was conducted at the, at the time that the squadron headquarters building uh, in the commander's conference room, and, and this is where Colonel Bullard comes back into play. So... I didn't know what to expect, man. Like, again, I, I don't know what I don't know. I don't even know where I am. Um, <laughs> I just know that it's different and I'll back up real quick. So <clears throat> we're, we're in the building, uh, yeah, building out in Western part of Fort Bragg and we're sitting there in a the classroom and we just, I think we just got done taking our, our psych test or whatever. And they had, had they had had a stage all our kit out in the cage building uh, for 
purposes we didn't know of yet. And I just remember sitting there and this, this, this guy comes in and he walks down the center of the aisle between us and he goes to the front and like the most stoic dude I'd ever seen in my life with zero emotion, very calmly, very softly reads this task condition and standard. Uh, and it was basically like, you know, at the time I say go, you'll have 10 minutes to depart this, go collect all your gear and be prepared to execute a movement. Go. And that was it. Like this guy had, he did not care about any of us. All right. He didn't care if any of us were successful. Um, and he, he's, he's a, he's a great friend now. And I, I've told him that story. Like <laughs> I told like, dude, when I first saw you and you read that, I was like, this dude doesn't care at all. Right. If any of us are successful, he just don't care. Yeah. Um, and so again, that was another indicator indication to me is like, this is, this is different, man. Like, yeah. You, like they're not have, looking for it to meet any quotas. They yeah. just, if, if none of you guys are good enough, that so be it. Yeah. They'll Here's wait for the next is. class. Yeah. Yeah. They're looking right. for specific people to make it. Yeah. Right. And so there was, there was no, like, there was nothing you could do to sort of like jockey uh, position to, to increase your chance of selection. Either you performed or you didn't. Right. And it was, it was that, that performance was going to be based on everything that, that I did as an individual and nothing uh, external was going to be, uh, you know, dependent upon my selection or non-selection. It was always something that, that I was going to do or not do. So yep. that, that, that was really good to kind of, again, set the tone early that this is, this is different. And, um, you know, it, it was exciting for me. Right. And so yeah. that's kind of how most of the week went. Uh, so fast forward towards the latter part of the week at the end, uh, when you go before your board again, I don't know what to expect. Although that's all the guy, the other guys that I was with was talking about was the board. They're like, Oh man, yeah. you know, I don't, this board is going to be freaking brutal or whatever. I'm like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. So I'm like, <laughs> which is probably things. better that you didn't know anything about it. They had probably yeah. heard a bunch of horror stories about they're going to get berated oh, yeah. or they're going to get asked a bunch of questions. But you had no idea. So it's, it's kind yeah. of better. Yeah. Yeah. They, they had, they had buddies that were already in the unit that, yeah. you know, they, I'm sure they had talked to, but I, I didn't know anybody. Right. And so <clears throat> I'm doing dumb. Well, I shouldn't say dumb, but I'm doing things that I think I need to do to prep for this board. Cause I, I think it's going to be like a stump the dummy type thing where they're yeah. going to be asking, grilling me questions about the J fire, and, you know, capabilities of weapons and aircraft and shit. So I'm like, before I'm, I'm in the waiting room, I'm like, you know, reviewing the J fire and, and things like this. Right. And I'm like, and so, uh, one of the combat controllers who went, actually, you don't see anybody. You don't see the people. Like they go, yeah, you, they, yeah, 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 yeah. They go out so a different door and you go out a different door yeah. and yeah, yeah. Basically. And so I think, uh, the chief at the time, chief, uh, Bruce Dixon was the two, four chief at the time. Awesome guy. Oh uh, yeah. Here. He's a great dude. He was getting ready to PCS. Out. So he had uh, another senior NCO, a senior master sergeant, uh, take his position on the board. But chief chief came and got me. He's like, okay, Brett, you, they're ready for you. He's like, good luck. And so, uh, you know, do your one knock, go in, report, reporting statement to the commander, Colonel Bullers in the center. You know, he's got the senior NCO. He's got the first sergeant, the psych doc. And then on his right, my left would be another senior NCO who is uh, one of the, the green team cadre, Andy, and somebody else. I can't remember that last word. Anyway, that was the board. And uh, so report, commander tells me to sit down. And, and they start asking me, you know, questions. And I will tell you to this day, like that board is a very pivotal moment in my life that uh again gave me some a, a super high dose of humility yeah and but also you know 
spark a, a, a tremendous amount of inspiration from from those people that I was sitting across from uh, right. and, and and behind them, actually behind me would have been, you know, we call it the wall of honor. And th those are pictures of all the fallen uh, from the unit. And so mm -hmm. just to be, you know, in that environment uh, was was a privilege enough. And then, sure. you know, to to recognize that the, the, the operators sitting on, on the table conducting my board, you know, were, were some just phenomenal human beings. And yeah. so one of the, the most striking things that came out of that board, the, uh, the senior NCO who was sitting in for the chief, uh, who is, who became my mentor, uh, after this, uh, he, he asked me a question or I think the commander, I think Colonel Bowler asked me, he, and I knew this was likely going to come up. Right. And the, the topic is, uh, my, my war trophy, uh, uh -huh. fiasco. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I, I had assumed that this would come up in the board. And so I had kind of rehearsed, you know, what I was, how I was going to respond to that if it came up and, and Colonel Bowler asked the question and, and quite frankly, I, I gave him, you know, kind of a bullshit answer. And I was like, Hey, sir, you know, yep, I, I screwed up. Um, but if I'm going to, you know, I think the guidance was, was unclear. I think there was you know, some misunderstandings in terms of, you know, what we could and couldn't bring back. And Oh, you're doing a little yeah. tap dancing. <laughs> I was tap dancing, man. And <laughs> I, I, I severely lack situational awareness and emotional intelligence in terms of, uh, how intelligent these people were. Yeah. And that they were, they were, they were seeing through my bullshit as soon as it was coming out of my mouth. Yeah. But Colonel Buller, you know, he's like, oh, okay, whatever. Uh, he let it go. And I think he handed it off to the first sergeant. The first sergeant asked me a question or two or something like that. And, uh, and then the senior NCO, he's like, uh, He's like, hey, uh, sir, if, if you wouldn't mind, if I could ask uh, the candidate, hey, could, could I go back to the, you know, war trophy thing for a second? And the commander was like, yeah, absolutely, sorry, go ahead. And and he called my bullshit, man. He's like, let me get this straight. The the general order was unclear. Is that is that what you're saying? <laughs> and and rightfully so, man. He was calling me on my bullshit. And, uh, again, I had to, I had to, at that point I couldn't tap dance anymore. Right. And, uh, and what they, the gift that they gave me in that moment was the realization that I had to, I hadn't fully taken responsibility for that, that mistake and that failure until yeah. that moment. Um, and you know, at, at the end of the, the, the board, the commander, and of course, Colonel Buller uh, piled on to, to the senior NCO's questions and, and comments. And, and he's like, hey, man, like, I'll be honest with you. He's like, I think your commander made the wrong decision. And it's like, I think your commander should have absolutely thrown your ass in jail. And he's like, I, I think you're, you're super lucky to be sitting here right now uh, based on your, your poor decision making. And, and man, they have the, the very unique capability of, of making you feel like you're a half inch tall yeah. uh, with, with just their presence, uh, but their, their words as well. And, and, but that's what I needed, man. Like I yeah. needed another super high dose of humility, you know, coming off a, a very, very successful 2007 deployment. Um, and, and they gave that to me, man. And, I'll never forget uh, Colonel Buller at the end of the the board. He's like, "Hey, man, I, I want to leave you with this." And he's like, "There's two ways to approach uh, a decision. He's like, you can either take uh, choose the the hard right or the easy wrong." Yeah. And and he's like, "I, I want you to really think about that and uh, you know you know reflect on that." And so. And then he asked me, he's like, Hey, uh, you know, if you're selected, like, you know, 
what do you want to do? You want to come up here and, and be a fires guy or you want to be an operator? And I'm like, sir, uh, you know, if, if given that opportunity, I, I want to be an operator. And he's like, okay. And so they kicked me out and uh, I went back into another holding room and they, you know, as they deliberated or whatever, and then brought me back in a little while later and, and uh, commander told me that he, he wanted to bring me up and uh, give me a chance to, to go through selection and, and OTC. And, and um, so, yeah, man, I got, got the head nod and, PCS to, to Fort Bragg and checked in the green team, uh, let's see, two and a half months later. So nice. my wife was still, my wife was still deployed in Iraq, uh, with the task force. Um, so that, that was interesting, you know, so she, she re redeployed in back to Bragg with the task force. Uh, so I met her at the loading dock there and coming off the C-17 and had a couple of days to try to find a house and, she went back to Colorado. I stayed there and she, uh, decided to transition out of active duty into the reserves and, okay. and then PCS with two kids and the dog and in the minivan all the way across the country to, uh, <laughs> to brag. And then I left for selection, like literally the, the next morning after they got oh, yeah. there. So Jeez. it was, it was really chaotic time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for for our family, uh, certainly my wife, and you know, coming in that transition for her, you know, uh, supporting all signals intelligence operations for the task force uh, downrange, yeah. and you know, two months later, uh, being a reservist and uh, a, a mother of two young kids, while her husband's, you know, all, gone all the time. Like that, that was a tough transition for her and. And again, uh, for all the dual military out there, man, like uh, I, I didn't recognize just how steep that transition uh, was for her. And, and uh, so I certainly could have offered a lot more support than I did for her at the time. I just I didn't know what I didn't know either. Sure, sure. Yeah, sometimes we forget. Um, it's just inherently the nature of us. We, you know, we're hard chargers. We lean forward. We try to you know, do as much as we can, but then we forget about there's other people that we need to take care of as well, or not, not yeah. just take care of, but give opportunities to like your wife was a, yeah. a pretty big deal. I mean, that's a huge yeah. responsibility. That's a very specialized unit. I mean, she was doing some great things for America and, uh, yeah. you know, sometimes we, you know, we're all guilty of it, you know, I mean, it happens, yeah. but yeah. So good on yeah. her though. That's a cool, that's a cool job. I mean, that's, that's really awesome that she was doing that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. She's phenomenal. Uh, she yeah. retired, uh, several years ago from the reserves and okay. yeah, she's, she's been the, the anchor of her family for a long time. So, so we don't have to go through green team. Um, cause I don't want to like, and obviously you probably shouldn't talk about what you did because other people, you know, can experience the same <laughs> fun green team experience you had. But, uh, so you made it through green team, which is phenomenal. I mean, there's only like at the time, did you go first or did Kirk go first through, uh, through that yeah, so, operator course? So, yeah. So we, we went through, we were on the same green team. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So Kirk and I, uh, so Kirk Newman, he was, uh, he was already assigned to two, four, uh, in the fire shop. He okay. was actually deployed down range, uh, until like literally like the week before we, we started green team and, which was wow. obviously, uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging <laughs> for Kurt, man. Cause yeah. uh, just redeploying. And then like the next week you're starting because the first back again, back then assessment was separate from selection, right. I, you know, in or, terms of, yeah. yeah so yeah. your, your assessment, you got, you got to, Hey, we're going to hire you. So PCS to Fort Bragg and check in the green team. But then the first thing you did on green team was selection. Oh, okay. So it, it's obviously now since changed and uh, a lot more efficient in the way we do things, but, um, but that's how we did it back then. So, so yeah, Kirk, um, he, he, he and I were on the same green team. I think we started, we started pretty, pretty big uh, green team. If I recall, we had, you know, probably mid twenties, I think we started. Oh, with, really? Okay. We, we lost, uh, you know, three or 
three or maybe four during selection. Um, <clears throat> but again, selection was, again, I, I was going in there completely oblivious to what to expect, um, which was probably a good thing for me. Uh, but, you know, it was challenging physically, mentally, um, but, you know, it's for a reason, right? And, and so selection, regardless of what flavor or how it's evolved over time, I think has, has gotten what the organization needed at the time. And so, <clears throat> so yeah, Kirk and I went through uh, same green team, same selection, um, and we both graduated at the same time. Had anybody gone through that kind of selection or been an operator up there, the two, four besides you two as tech peas, uh, were you the first two tech peas to do that? Or were there somebody before you guys? We were the first two tech peas to officially go through, uh, selection and the operator training course. I, okay. I would be, I, I would fail if I wouldn't acknowledge the, the sacrifices and the, the pathway that, that the other tech peas, for uh, sure provided us yeah, you yeah. Know, in, in in building that credibility in our into our career field uh, at that organization serving in the in a fires capacity i Definitely. do know that there's there were there were those fires tech peas that uh at times you know filled gaps operationally downrange um yeah. as jtax whether that's uh on the assault side or uh, combat search and rescue side mm. but to you know if we were to be technical, Kirk and I were the, the first two tech P's to, to go through the full up assessment selection operator training course, and then be, uh, assigned to, uh, our operational, uh, teams. Right. Yeah. I mean, you guys, you got guys like Marty Klukas and Nate Holton and, yeah. you know, like you mentioned, Kale was there, Kale Huff, Kale and I were stationed together at, at Fort Benning for a long time. Uh, yeah. Andy Cornelius, you know, stellar, stellar yeah. dude. So yeah, that they're the fire shop to your point, like there, they were doing other things just be, just than scheduling yeah. TDYs. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah they would I think yeah. deploy, they would run the fires desk, you know, and they would fill gaps operationally downrange uh, for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, and again, like th there's no way that our career field would have even had the opportunity to, uh, to, to go to assessment and selection in OTC had it not been for the, the road that those guys paid before us. For sure. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so you get out of green team, you make it, You're a, now you're a 2-4 operator, which is a, a phenomenal feat. I mean, if, for people that don't know, it's 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 a very specialized elite thing to do. I mean, you know, as far as, like, things go, I mean, it's up, I, to me, I it's on the same par as, like, Navy SEAL and Army Ranger and, you know, any, any special operator out there, a 2-4 operator is at that level. So tell me about that. Tell me what happened after green team and uh, you know, your deployments and uh, as much as you can, I know <clears throat> if, along with that, along with that elite status comes with a lot of, you know, higher classification. So there's a lot of things that I'm sure you did that are, that we can't talk about on here and that no one will ever know about. So just, you know, whatever yeah. you can, whatever you can divulge, you know, maybe sanitize the stories a little bit, but yeah, I'd love to hear your experiences there because I, like I said, I'm not, I, I never, I, I, I didn't know much about the two, four still kind of don't. And, uh, I, I was always fascinated with you and Kirk up there being, doing, being operators and, and doing that kind of thing. So yeah, please. Yeah. I'll, I'll start with, I think that, that, that term operator gets thrown around pretty loosely nowadays. I, I never yeah. really, you know, gravitated towards it. I just, you know, I, I felt, I felt privileged to be a part of an organization, uh, with, with the history and the heritage that, that the two, four, uh, has, um, so yeah, I'll just kind of give you a broad brush on, on my, my career there at, at the unit. Um, I started off, I uh, was assigned to, to blue team. So there, there was four teams within the unit. Uh, I was assigned to blue team as a, their J as one of the JTACs on the team. And, and we support the army and the Navy, uh, predominantly, uh, mm -hmm. and then we're also responsible for, um, personal recovery and combat search and rescue for, for the, team, for the command. And just so for those who don't just, I know you kind of glossed over it for, for obvious reasons, but I just want people to know when he says army and Navy, he doesn't mean like the conventional army and the like boats in the Navy. He means like the yeah. most yeah. specialized people out there. So like it's a higher, yeah, I don't, and I don't want to get too far yeah. into it, but yeah, the, it's the, it's the, it's as high as you can go, frankly, in the military is what, who you were supporting the, the, the most elite yeah, I mean, people out there. 
I mean, at the end of the day, like you, you can Google, you know, Joint Special Operations right. Command, and right. you know, there's there's friggin' YouTube videos on you know Tier One organizations. <laughs> right, right. So just a unique, it's just different, right? You know, you, you get access to uh, different training opportunities, different skill sets uh, that are way outside of your, let's say, your, your traditional profession or, or AFSC, um, and so. You know, when, when our team, when our green team graduated, the, the chief at the time uh, told us, like, you know, you're, you're now part of an organization where you have to really work hard to be average. Uh, right. And so that, that really stuck with me uh, and that, that continued to fuel the fire to, you know, always put my best foot forward, uh, have a growth mindset and continues, continue to learn. Uh, and grow my, my skill set. So um, de- my first deployment was uh, as a member of the, uh, one of our combat search and rescue teams uh, back to Afghanistan. Uh, so typical composition back then would, would be uh, three PJs and a, and a JTAC, whether that's a, a TACP or a combat controller. And uh, it just covering down for, for that CSAR capability and support of, in, in our case, it was Task Force South uh, out of Kandahar. So <clears throat> um, that was my first deployment after Green Team. Uh, a good opportunity, right? I, I've never done CSAR operations before, so a lot to learn there. Sure. Uh, and it, it was a good rotation. Um, you know, CSAR is one of those capabilities where you hope you never have to use it. Right. Um, and the, uh, the team that we ripped out was... Uh, led by uh, John Brown, pararescueman, uh, and Andy Harvell, uh, combat controller. Uh, they were very active during their CSAR rotation. Uh, so when we ripped them out, you know, we were expecting uh, to have to do something, right? Um, but uh, I would say, fortunately, uh, you know, we, we never got a, a serious call uh, for, yeah. for CSAR employment, but uh, we were there nonetheless uh, if, if we were needed. Um, yeah, it kind of sucks. It's like you, like to your, like you were saying, you don't combat search and rescue. Obviously, somebody's in a bad way, so you don't yeah. want to do it. But then you also don't want to sit around the whole deployment. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah. Yeah, it really sucks for the rangers to get uh, tasked. Oh yeah. Because we typically <laughs> have uh, four rangers uh, that that round out the CSAR team, and and I felt bad for those guys, man, because they they'd much rather, rightfully so, be out running and gunning. Yeah. All their buddies are getting after it while they're sitting on alert waiting to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, CSAR rotation there. Um, and then I moved over to, uh, another squadron within, we had become a group. So the the 24 STS had, uh, grown into the 724 special tactics group. All right. Uh, and there, there's several squadrons within the group. Um, I was, I was vectored into one of the other squadrons, um, to, uh, in the, in the operations chief role, uh, helping, helping plan and, and, and manage operations in in that particular squadron. Uh, I won't go into the details of of what what their role is, but uh, it's, let's just say it's, it's left a bang in terms of, uh, conflict. Uh, gotcha. Although, you know, it certainly happened there as well. Uh, so I spent, you know, a few years in that organization, uh, deployed uh, from that organization downrange uh, into a, um, a regional task force leadership position. So I was a senior enlisted leader for a regional task force downrange. Yes. Again, um, pretty much o- oversight, you know, uh, care and feeding of, of all of our uh, operators and support personnel in, in country conducting that operation and that mission, which was another unique experience um, for me because, you know, there's a lot of uh, Department of State and interagency coordination uh, that that, oh, that yeah. role was responsible for. <clears throat> so uh, oh, a, yeah. a pretty unique yeah. experience there. And, uh, you know, we, we had a, a great team. Uh, it was Again, talk about being the only Air Force dude. There was myself, and there was a, a STO, a Special Tactics Officer, who was the J three uh, at that RTF, and so he and I were the only Air Force dudes. It was predominantly a, a Navy, 
well, it was a, a Navy RTF. Uh, okay. But again, this I, I, I bring this up because it's important, I think, to recognize the credibility that that organization has uh, across the command. And so <clears throat> when you consider, you know, our, our Navy in this, in my case, our, our Navy counterparts having the trust and confidence that uh, an Air Force senior NCO can go down range and serve in a leadership position over SEALs, um, that, I mean, I, I think that's a pretty compelling case in terms of the, the credibility that the, the organization has, has achieved. Uh, oh, for sure. In, in that command. And yeah, yeah. But at the same time, right, it's like you got to uh, like you got to perform. Right. And so um, and, and you want to represent uh, not only yourself, but your organization and the command itself. So there it, and those, those type of missions are super high visibility. Um, there's there's a, a, great, a good deal of risk associated with. Uh, if something were to go bad. So, um, Oh, for sure. Uh, <clears throat> the stakes are a little bit higher. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's what they're there to do. So I, I felt again, another great opportunity that uh, I was provided and really was up to me to, to screw it up. And, and yeah. thankfully uh, uh, I was successful there. So uh, after that, I was, I, I pushed out to uh, our detachment uh, which was responsible for recruitment, assessment, selection, and training. So oh, cool. green team, basically. Nice. And so I was the senior enlisted leader for that was in charge of, of that process for the unit. And I was out there for three years. I uh, led that um, mission space. And I'll wow. be honest with you, that was probably the most formative time of my career there at the unit was, was in that role. And I, I learned a lot uh, about myself. I learned a lot about human behaviors and psychology. Uh, oh, yeah. I learned a lot about, you know, the characteristics that uh, we felt at the time um, produced the best operators. And, and we used that, that information and uh, the experts that we had on, on staff to, to help us tighten up the shot group and, and refine the way that we approached uh, assessment, selection, and training. So uh, a lot of very evolutionary things uh, went into play as we as we changed the way selection uh, used to be, which is kind of the way that, that Kirk and I and everybody else uh, at that time went through to the way yeah. it's kind of set up right now. Um, and that was, you know, really, really proud to be part of that transition uh, in that period of time at the, at the dead out there. You know, I had a lot of, you know, phenomenal uh, OTC cadre, you know, instructors that that carried the mail, man. Like that's a lot of folks say, like, you I mean, if, if you need to take a knee and, um, you know, get some operational, <clears throat> take an operational pause, you know, go to go to green team and be an instructor, man. Like <laughs> it's really the opposite. Uh, really? <laughs> because th those guys do just a, a lion's share of a lot of different things. Um, and, and really we started to use the, the debt as a developmental opportunity uh, and, you, and identify some key leadership positions within the, the detachment that would, you know, help broaden uh, our operator pool as, as we look to advance them into further leadership positions throughout their career in the, in the unit. So okay. uh, like I said, a lot of great, guys uh both as instructors uh you know trey free uh, the selection chief there man just a tremendous source of, of knowledge and, and experience and, and mentorship that I, that I got from that guy and he continues to to lead uh selection there and, and continue to push the envelope in terms of evolution and and doing things for a purpose not just doing yeah. things because we can so nice um I got, uh, so I left, finished uh, my career there at the unit uh, at leading selection and training. And I left in late 2017. Okay. Uh, based on, I, I, got, I got promoted to, to chief. Uh, the unit didn't have any E9 billets for, for TACP. So um, I had to move on 
And so I yeah. pushed over to the 14th, uh, was it the chief of the 14th for a short period of time, really, uh, just a little under a year. Okay. Uh, but uh, again, you know, you spent some time there. You know, it's just a great organization. Uh, again, a lot of history going back to, to Panama and, and, and those operations and uh, great organization there. Uh, great partners in the 82nd Airborne and oh, yeah. 18th Airborne Corps. Uh, can't say enough good stuff about those those partners. Uh, yeah, I was never actually stationed there, but I, I spent a lot of time there. I went to the uh, 18th ASOG Jump Master Course, and it just seems like you're always in at Fort Bragg for something. So, yeah, yeah. and the 14th, I've always been real impressed with those guys. I mean, it's just always traditionally been a, a hard-charging unit to, you know, I, it, by, I guess by nature because they got to support the 82nd. They're, they're airborne, so... A little more, a yeah. little more high, hard charging than most, but yeah, great unit. Yeah. And so, uh, I would say that, uh, just go back real quick to my time at, at the 724, um, and, and what I learned about myself again, and I, I go back to it because I think it's important for uh, your audience or your audience and some of the younger guys. It's like, um, and one of our former commanders there, he, he put it to it to us this way. He's like, Hey, you know, in order for our organization to be successful, we, we need a, a combination of a few things. Number one, we need, uh, professionalism, uh, and we need to conduct ourselves in a professional manner in, in all everything that we do, uh, whether that's on the battlefield or operational planning or whatever the case may be, uh, professionalism oftentimes starts to build your credibility and, um, or correction, professionalism and competence, right? So competence being that second ingredient. Okay. And so that, that competence piece uh, goes towards your discipline in be, trying to become a master of your craft, whatever that might be. And so what do you need to do every single day in order to continue to challenge yourself to continuously, you know, move that, that line of failure farther to the right and um, how do you, how do you approach, uh, learning new things? Do you, do you have a growth mindset or do you have a closed mindset where you think, you know, oh, I know everything I don't need to, to practice or I don't need right. a PT today or I don't need to whatever. Um, you know, that's the ego, you know, talking and which thinks that, uh, you know, you're, you're the greatest thing. So there's that professionalism piece. There's a competence piece that, that those two combined will get you some credibility, right? And credibility mm -hmm. will enable you to, uh, you know, have some freedom of maneuver, both as an individual and certainly in my case, you know, go back to, to my failure. I built through my professional professionalism and competence up to that point where I made that, that failure and that mistake. Uh, but I had built up some credibility that kind of helped me ride the wave through that, that, catastrophic failure that I, that I made. Um, so professionalism, competence gets you some credibility. That credibility gets you some freedom of maneuver to, to go out and conduct things um, and, and be creative and innovative uh, on the battlefield and back home uh, to really increase lethality and readiness. So um, I, I learned that certainly at my time there at the 2-4. Um, and I'm just super grateful for the opportunity uh, to have served there and served with the guys, uh, both operators and the support folks. Uh, Cause yeah. that's the other thing, like every single human being in that organization is selected. Uh, right. You can't just, you don't just get PCS orders to the, to the unit uh, and show up. Like every human being is, is selected. And so uh, you, you don't find that in any other organization to my knowledge uh, in the air force. Yeah. And so, you know, like, everybody that's there wants to be there. Um, and so that's a pretty unique opportunity that, um, not a lot of folks, um, either desire or have the opportunity to experience. So, um, very, very humbled to, to been able to be a part of that organization for a short period of time. So, uh, I just want to share that with, uh, the audience there. The other thing too, is, um, you know, there's a lot of former, you know, retired operators that, that still serve in the, in the unit. Um, and it's, it was always great. Every time I had the opportunity to, to sit down and, and chat with those guys and, and they're legends in their own right. Right. And they're yeah. talk, I'll draw name drop once specifically, you know, Scotty fails. He's a 
uh, prayer rescue men uh, in the Battle of Mogadishu, uh, Silver oh, yeah, Star yeah. recipient. He was there with Tim Wilkinson and uh, you know Dan Schilling and, and some other folks that were there. Um, but we would have him come out uh, and talk to our our green team guys coming going through training. And uh, I remember one day he he was talking to the guys, and obviously I was sitting there because I'm getting something out of it too, right? And I want to learn. And he said, um, he's like, a, a lot of people think that you rise to the the challenge. He's like, but you actually fall to your level of training and incompetence, right? And so um, I think there's different variations to that quote, but um, I, I think it's true, right? Like we like to we like to think that, well, if if something catastrophic or or unexpected happens, like I'm just gonna figure it out in the moment uh, and it'll all work out where it, that might happen, but I don't want to put, I don't want to bet on it. I'd rather, right. you know, cause in that, that fight or flight moment, typically you, you fall to whatever level of training that you've, you've disciplined yourself to uh, maintain. Right. Right. Um, and so again, that, that was certainly applicable to, to us as instructors uh, leading the green team uh, class through training and, and certainly applicable to them as they uh, approach every training ev- evolution uh, with that sense of uh, urgency and purpose to make sure that they're uh, as technically and tactically competent as they could be uh, so that if and when the time comes when they're in a dynamic stressful environment that that level of training that they fall to they're not falling very far if at all right. so um I, I, was, I want to share that with the, the audience there as well. So Yeah, that's good advice. I mean, the, the, the kind of customers, if you will, or the kind of peers you were hanging with at that level, they're not falling too far either. So if you're not, if your yeah. game isn't where they are, you're kind of, you're bringing them down and you're going to struggle for sure. So that's, that's a great point. Yeah. So, but you didn't, when did you, where did you go after that? Like you went, uh, you were at the 14th, but then you went, didn't you go somewhere else after that as a chief? Yeah. So I, uh, I guess I was at the 14th for like nine months. Uh, yeah. one of our other former commanders at the, at the 724th, um, uh, Colonel Martin, he got selected to, uh, go lead a directorate up at headquarters air force, the Pentagon. And he, he had just been selected for his first star. He's oh, okay. now two star. Nice. Uh, he, he called me up and he's like, Hey man, uh, general Goldfine asked me to come do this thing. Uh, I don't really know what it is. Uh, but I need a chief. Like, what do you think? And, you know, Colonel Martin at the time when he was our commander and he was a deputy commander before that, um, man, he, he was always in my corner yeah. and he was always, um, he, he's super intelligent and he, I'll just put it this way. He, he always looked out for me and, um, and so when he called me up and he, was, and he asked me about it, I was like, Hey, sir, man, if I get the opportunity to serve with you again, like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do this. Sure. Not, not knowing really what it is, what it was that we were going to go do. So, yeah. So we get up to the Pentagon and we, he is the director of <clears throat> what's called, uh, air force integrated resilience. So okay. It, it falls under headquarters Air Force A1, which is, you know, all the personnel and policy and programs that, that right. manage the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And so if you can imagine, you know, a special tactics officer and me, uh, you know, spending our entire careers on the operational side of the house and, and deploying into combat and so forth and so on. And now we're at the Pentagon in charge of uh, suicide prevention, sexual assault prevention and response, and whatever this ambiguous resilience thing is, All right? We're like, you know, what do we do with our hands? Yeah. And, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But that's exactly what General Goldfein wanted, right? And you know, so the Air Force, all all components, not just the Air Force, you know, you know, suicide is is an issue. Yeah. Uh, it's a problem. Uh, you know, we have policies, we have programs, we have resources, we have all this stuff in place. Uh, but is it really making a difference? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he, I I think general Goldfein's intent was to bring, uh, some folks 
in from from way outside the the normal bubble of of kind of that mission space yeah. and see if if we had a slightly different approach to uh, potentially making some some progress in these very very serious uh, and critical uh, areas and so yeah. uh, we you know for for me as as his senior enlisted leader um, you know I, I, my job was to support him and mm. and uh, I think the way that I did that was was to try to look at a, a long standing problem from a different perspective and that that was sure. easy for me because I didn't know shit about right. any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, other than it was bad, right? Right. And we needed to change it. So uh, we spent two years, uh, and General Martin actually deployed out of there, and we had a, another special tactics officer, uh, General Officer, uh, General Tudor, coming back to him as the director. So I had the opportunity to serve uh, for both of them in that role. Uh, and it, it, I'll tell you, it was, it's a very, very challenging, it was a challenging assignment uh, for me, uh, both professionally and personally, mentally, all of that, because, yeah. uh, and I didn't quite recognize or, or, uh, acknowledge just how difficult it was until one of our, our, uh, teammates said one day, a civilian guy, he's like, Hey, how do you, how do you maintain the morale of an organization who where, you know, just one incident you've already failed. And so his point to get, give a little bit of context was, uh, as soon as there's one death by suicide in the air force, we have failed. Mm -hmm. As soon as there's one sexual assault in the air force, we have failed. And right. so his question was, <clears throat> how do you maintain morale <clears throat> in an organization whose sole purpose and mission is to prevent these things from happening? But as soon as either one happens, you know, we've already failed. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then it just gets progressively worse as, as the numbers increase, uh, on right. both sides. And that, that struck me, man. Cause, um, you know, we, we had a small team up there, uh, and, and everybody there, man, was every single day they came to work trying to figure out a way to reduce these negative behaviors from, from happening and, yeah. and helping our airmen and families, um, you know, in, in, in multitudes of ways to, to mitigate those things from happening. But, uh, so it was a challenging thing. And, and just to kind of wrap that one up was, you know, our approach was instead of, uh, another policy, instead of another program, uh, because we've had all those for decades and, you know, I used to say this all the time in front of, you know, chief master in the air force and, and air force senior enlisted leader council is I came in like, and, and chief master on the air force, right. Phenomenal leader, man. Like that guy, uh, I became a command chief because of, of that human being. Um, but I used to tell them all the time, uh, it was like, Hey, a, a piece of paper, whether it's an AFI or whatever the case, like this is not going to save an airman's life. This piece of paper and the words written on it is not going to prevent the next case of sexual assault or harassment. Right. I said, but you know what will mitigate it? It's, it's solid leadership at the tactical level. It's actually treating people with dignity and respect mm -hmm. uh, and, and putting your troops needs ahead of your own. Like in my opinion, that's going to do way more to start to reduce the incidence of these things from happening way more effectively than a freaking piece of paper that nobody's going to read anyway. Right. And so that was the approach uh, that we recommended, which, Hey, let's start focusing more on leadership development at the, at the lowest level. I'm talking like frontline uh, team leader level. Yeah. Um, and if we can, start to indoctrinate and inculcate that, that leader mentality at the lowest level and sustain that over a career, <clears throat> in my opinion, uh, that's going to do way more uh, to prevent, you know, suicide and sexual assault than a piece of paper and a new policy. That's right. basically the same thing. You just change the date on it. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, 
you know, for any of our, uh, uh, for any of the audience that's still active duty uh, or in the guard in the Air Force in general, that remember the resilience tactical pause that occurred. Uh, you're welcome. That was that was uh, our brainchild. Uh, although I will tell you firsthand, like it was not executed the way it was intended. Yeah. Um, but it is what it is. And, but the, yeah. the, the sole intent and purpose of that, uh, that resilience talking pause was, was to 100% focus on leadership development and, and instilling a sense of duty uh, and responsibility of taking care of your troops um, and, and looking after their needs. That, that was the intent. And, and I'm sure you, you, experience this in your career, you know, the army does, uh, at least they used to do every Thursday afternoon was sergeant's time. Yeah. And, and that was, that was time that was sacred time dedicated to small unit leaders, uh, enlisted leaders, uh, doing things that they, that they decided that they needed to do with their troops, mm-hmm. whether that was training, whether that was just having a barbecue, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, but that was sacred time that the army, recognize the value in and, and protected that time uh, to their small unit leaders. Uh, honestly, the Air Force, in my opinion, they don't, we don't get it, man. Like we don't understand the the critical value that, that, that small unit leadership on the enlisted side can bring to the fight. Like definitely it's, it just pisses me off. And, um, and the fact that, um, you know, take PT for an example, like, Cause I used to say this all the time. I was like, you know, what do you guys, what'd you guys do for PT this morning? I'm like, Oh, I don't have time. I'm like, let me ask you this question. Uh, go on any army or Marine Corps installation between the hours of zero six and eight o'clock and tell me what you see. And they're like, well, what? I'm like, you're going to see the entire post PT. Right. I said, so if, if two entire services, can PT every single day of the week. Why can't we? Right. <clears throat> well, I think it's a culture thing. Wouldn't you say like, it's like in our, in our career field, in our, in our world, it was, you know, you come in, you did PT, you, you shower, you, you know, you come in, get in uniform yeah. by nine o'clock. It, that was unheard of in the, in the conventional air force world. They were just like, well, you don't, you don't show up to work until nine. It's like, no, I'm, I'm at work. I'm working out. I mean, we, we, right. we right. carve out a time to uh you know that's that part of the day is just as important as any other part of the day you know for right. for obvious reasons so yeah i'm with you yeah yeah and, and i'll say um the value of pt like the physical piece of it is just one aspect but in my sure. opinion that's that's the s- smallest portion of the positive things that, that occur during a, a physical training session with with your your team or your your unit the, right. the more the, the, the value that I see out of it is is building strengthening that bond at the team level, the small unit level, um, you know, giving it an opportunity to to practice and develop and, and mature your leadership skills um, to continue to build credibility and trust and confidence uh, within your team yeah. uh, to to know, you know, have that that 30 to 90 second conversation between you know, dismissal of your formation and your job to the, to the gym with your troop and say, Hey man, like, how was the weekend? Like right. you're going to find out a lot of stuff in that 90 <laughs> seconds that you otherwise wouldn't have had you not invested just that short amount of time in genuine uh, concern and care for them otherwise. And that's something yeah. that I, in my opinion, you know, I'm retired now, man. So I can, you know, gloves are off. Like, the Air Force absolutely fails every single day of not capitalizing on those opportunities. For sure. And and then we scratch our heads and we wonder why we have so such, you know, high rates of, of negative behaviors. And then, you know, the first the first response is, well, let's let's just write another policy. Yeah. And it's it, what's opinion, the easy button? You know, it's it's like it's, uh, I it's put it out, button. you guys better do it. And it's like, well, that's not the way the world works. You know, the, you can, you can say it all day long, but if you're not emotionally invested in your guys or your, your troops, yeah, there yeah. you, you'd have no idea. Yeah. The other thing, I think the reason why the air force likes to hide behind policy, 
and this would really piss me off when I'm talking to other uh, chiefs in the Air Force was would be, and I would challenge them on this too because you know I, I would be you know Chief Master in the Air Force would ask me to to brief at different conferences and <clears throat> senior leader engagements and things and and every time I'd have you know a, a big group of Air Force chiefs come up to me after the the fact because I would say some pretty provocative things. Sure. Um, and, and in my opinion, why not? There's no E10, man. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so these guys would come up to me and they're like, well, chief, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but you know, if we just had a, a policy, you know, that said this or that or the other, and I'm like, you know what guys, like, you know, you know why you want a policy so that you don't have to make a decision right. so, don't, so that you don't have to actually lead or critically think or take into consideration uh, unique life circumstances of your airmen and families. You want to be able to to hide behind a policy and say, "Well, sorry, you know, Airman Snuffy, but I can't help you because this piece of paper or this digital thing tells me I can't." I'm like, yeah. that's why you want a freaking policy. Yeah. Um, and, wouldn't you, you say know, that? Wouldn't you say that it would be better to have less? actual policies from above and let the the guys on the ground, the guys that actually know what's going on in the situation kind of make those decisions as yeah. they see fit. I mean, obviously have some guidance, but you know, get, empower yeah. these, empower these lower leaders to make those, those decisions and make those relationships. Yeah. And, and here's the irony is the air force has those policies. It's called uh, air force one dash one and one dash two. All right. So start there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, That's exactly. all you need. Um, so anyway, I got kind of on a tangent there, uh, but I'm, oh, I'm valid, passionate though. about that that subject because I, I just see a lot of airmen and families uh, really just get railroaded um, yeah. because people are, are more concerned about their own careers uh, and they're scared of making any decision, uh, especially the wrong decision. Right. And so I think they're they're paralyzed by that fear, and unfortunately, it. it it's at the detriment of our airmen and families. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, like I said, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Air Force Wright was. Um, he, I, I had the opportunity to be an advisor to his Air Force Senior Enlisted Leader Council, which is comprised of all the MAGCOM and higher uh, command chiefs, and so that was a, a really unique opportunity for me. I felt privileged to be asked to to be an advisor to that that. Uh, body. Um, and, you know, he, he called me down in his office one day and asked me, you know, he's, he's a good guy, man. They're like, didn't have any agenda. He's just like, Hey man, what have you thought about, you know, what you want to do next? And I'm like, man, chief, like, I'm just trying to figure out what I'm trying to do today. <laughs> and, uh, he kind of laughed. He's like, and he asked me, you know, what I thought about maybe, uh, becoming a command chief and, you know, Chief Wright is is kind of human being. Like he he just he's a genuine person. Um, very quickly, like he just his presence. Like you just trust this guy, right? And yeah. And uh, you know, you know, because of that level of trust that I had in him, I was told him like, "Hey, Chief, to be honest with you, like I don't, I don't really, I don't really see myself as as a command chief kind of person or or you know caliber and." Uh, he, he chuckled and he's like, well, that's exactly why you need, you should be a command chief. And, um, so I, I thought about it and there was, uh, some things that, that we were trying to accomplish as a family, uh, to kind of, my, my wife's from, uh, outside of Boston originally. So we were trying to, you know, migrate back up to the new England area. So, uh, there was a couple opportunities that were command chief opportunities that were coming vacant. Uh, in the New England area, uh, threw my name in the hat for both of them. Uh, one was at Hanscom, the other one was at uh, Barnes Air National Guard Base uh, in Massachusetts as well. Uh, interviewed for both of them. Um, got selected to to be the command chief for the 104th Fighter Wing at, at Barnes Air National Guard Base. Nice. And so we PCSed, uh, which was a, again another unique opportunity. Uh, Total Force Initiative, Active yeah. Duty Chief serving uh as a guard fighter wing command chief so uh another great opportunity 
uh, back in the operational environment as a, as a fighter yeah. wing, uh, F-15C fighter wing, you know, is a phenomenal mission, phenomenal people, 24 seven alert mission, uh, wow. covering down on the Eastern air defense sector for the United States. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so we PCS up to, uh, Western Massachusetts in June of 2020, uh, and started that, started that, uh, that role there. So, um, again, and that, so again, unique environment, right? So active duty chief, uh, coming to a guard fighter wing. And so the guard is very unique, uh, in, in many ways, but yeah. Uh, one, they're, they're super technically and tactically, uh, competent. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a misnomer that, that folks have about the guard is, you know, they're just weekend warriors. Um, certainly wasn't the case for our wing, you know, a thousand person wing, two thirds of us were, were full time. So it was pretty okay. much like a, an active duty wing, but, but highly competent. Uh, the other unique thing about the guard is there's a lot of longevity and a lot of continuity that come with the guard. So, you know, we had. We had folks that have been there for, uh, you know, pretty close to 30 years, man. Wow. And so uh, that can be a good thing and a bad thing, right? Sure. Um, and so, you know, I, I was a active duty chief coming in this wing where there were already 12 other chiefs that had been in the wing for, uh, you know, decades, right? And yeah. So, how was that? I mean, were they receptive or were they like, what's this active duty guy coming in here? I've been here 20 years and what, you know, why were they, yeah. were they upset that you took the job or were they like, Oh, this is cool. Or how was it? I think, uh, generally speaking, you know, er everybody was, was super professional. Right. And okay. so I, you know, and I, and I place, I put myself in their, their position and I'm like, okay, sure. how would I feel? Uh, if, if this scenario kind of played itself out and I was, uh, in their shoes. And, and so I, I went into that, that position, uh, with, with a pretty tremendous level of humility. And uh, because I, in order for us, the wing to be successful, like I, I had to rely upon their expertise and their experience, sure. uh, cause I, I had none within the wing. Right. right. And so, um, you know, I, I sat down with, uh, every single one of the, the chiefs on across the wing individually. Uh, and, and we talked through a lot of that and talked through like, Hey, this is who I am. This is kind of how I see things. Like, uh, you guys are the experts. You've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I'm simply here to the commander and I are, are simply here to empower and enable you guys to be successful. So, right. you know, if, if there's barriers to, to the mission that, that, um, you can't overcome at your level, like, that's what we're here to do is knock them down and, and enable you and your troops to, to crush it. So, uh, I think that helped. Um, I think depending on, you know, who you were talking to, everybody probably had their own opinions and, and whatnot. And that's, you know, it is what it is. Right. But yeah. at the end of the day, uh, you know, that, that two year period, I think we made a, a significant amount of positive change towards increasing lethality and readiness of that organization. Uh, my commander, he's a phenomenal leader, uh, former active duty, uh, F 15 C, you know, long career F 15 C pilot, uh, former weapons school commandant. Um, wow. just a, just a historic career in his own right. Um, uh, but more importantly, just a great human being. And yeah. he and I were, were pretty much like, almost perfectly aligned in terms of our, our leadership approach to uh, the wing and, and how we wanted to lead that, uh, lead that wing. And, and we, we spent, you know, two solid days, just him and I at the beginning of our tour. So we came on right about the same time. There might've been oh, like okay. two, two and a half weeks uh, before, you know, his change of command and then I showed up, but we spent, you know, two days <clears throat> together, you know, getting to know each other, talking through leadership philosophy, uh, you know, kind of what are the big rocks that, that we know we have to uh, address? Uh, what do we want to do? Right. And then, yeah. and then distilling that down into what's reasonable in terms of getting things done in a, in a two year tour. So uh, yeah. we came up with, you know, kind of four guiding principles uh, to, to lead our decision-making uh, and, and those were, were, everything has to start with trust. So trust is, is the, the number one 
uh, guiding principle that, that we, uh, that drove our leadership. Um, number two was, uh, trust empowerment, empowerment. So empowering your airmen, uh, to do what they are tactically and technically competent to do, uh, at their level without, you know, micromanaging them, um, and creating an environment where they have to, uh, ask mother may I, or daddy may I, before they do something. So we want to empower down to the lowest level, um, any, any, and every time we can, yeah. uh, bold action, you know, uh, combat, you know, requires a level of bold action. Uh, it's in, inherent. Uh, and if you're, if we're breeding dependence and robots, uh, if we're, if we're training our airmen just to be robots, then they don't, they're not going to exercise the bold action required, uh, when uncertainty and un- unexpected conditions arise. And so, uh, we, we try to train, uh, at least the bold action mindset in them every single day. Nice. Uh, and so that was, that was pretty cool to watch them, uh, start to execute that. And then the last guiding principle was, uh, teamwork. So trust, empowerment, bold action and teamwork. So, uh, recognizing that, that everything, uh, no one's going to get, be successful by themselves. It's going to require a team effort, um, not just within an organization, but across the wing, right? And so uh, those those four guiding principles really drove the way that we led the wing. Um, and then we, we piled on to that as well. I took a lot of the lessons learned that I, I learned from my time at the 724 and, and leading selection. Um, and we started to map out, like, hey, what are the character, what are the leadership characteristic traits that we feel you know, if you were to picture the, the best leader that you've ever uh, came across and served under, you know, if you were to write down five adjectives to describe their character from a leadership perspective, what would those five words be, right? Yeah. And so we did that as a wing, and then we, uh, we, we defined them in our own terms, and then uh, we actually had 10 of them. Uh, and then, you know, that became the way that we, uh, continuously provided critical feedback um, and made leadership decisions in terms of uh, vectoring, you know, airmen to various key leadership positions across the wing. So it was like, oh, nice. Uh, so that really helped. Um, you know, th- there was no like, nothing was hidden behind the curtain. It's like, okay, yeah. if an airman wants to achieve a certain level of, of leadership responsibility, here's the playbook, man. Like these are the things that that not not Chief Barbie or Colonel Bladen uh, value. It's it's what you guys said you value in a leader. Yeah. Like you wrote the book. Now it's up to you to to exercise the discipline um, to demonstrate and embody those characteristics uh, to to earn the the right to lead at, at higher echelon. So that's uh, smart. Yeah, it's so, like a roadmap for these kids that are you know if they're like because they're. It's that kind of brings back a point that in, in our career field, a lot of guys are asking, why do I make chief? And I, that's why I always envy the ST world, like especially Chief Dixon. You mentioned him earlier. I asked yeah. him one day, like, what what's it take? And he's like, what, you don't have this list of stuff? He had like a like a no kidding checklist of things you yeah. should probably be doing to, to get that way. That's kind of t- inherent, like kind of to your point, what you were saying to your guys. I mean, if, if you p- give people a roadmap or a set of criteria to aspire to, it makes it a lot easier than just trying to fumble through and figure it out and hopefully get lucky someday. You know, yeah. Yeah. It, I would agree with that. And not that it has to be a necessarily a, a fully linear uh, path. You know, there, there's, there's many different pathways and for and sure ways to yeah. get there. But to your point, like we, we define what that, that could look like, right? Here's your menu of options on how to, to uh, professionalize yourself um, personally and, and professionally and, and, technical competence and so forth and so on. So, uh, just, just doing that gave a, a level of confidence in, in our airmen that, okay, here, here's my playbook. I'm going to pick on here where, you know, where my passions lie and kind of what resonates with me, knowing that regardless of what option I pick on this menu, if I, uh, embody these characteristics and kind of follow this, this, uh, path that I, I might be able to achieve a certain level of leadership uh, later in my career. 
what it yeah. wasn't though, it wasn't a, it wasn't a checklist on how to get promoted. Um, oh. and that was a message that, that I know that I, I carried every single time I talked about it, it was like, uh, guys like this is not, this is not a checklist to get promoted. Um, you, you will get promoted just by doing the things that are, that are, are listed on this piece of paper. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. So yeah, the promotions yeah. will come like, don't, don't necessarily make that your goal. Like, Oh, I just want to be a chief. Like, okay, well, why? And they're like, yeah, well, yeah. you know, because, right. uh, you, you really don't get to make decisions until you're chief. I'm like, okay, well, there's your, your first, you know, myth. Like, yeah, yeah. And I would tell our airmen because not because I want to blow smoke up their ass because it was really true. I'm like, you actually have more decision making authority than I do. Like, For sure. I, you know, a lot of leadership models will, you know, take the the form of a pyramid, right? And you know, who's typically at the top? It's it's the E nine or the O six or whatever the case may be. Well, Colonel Blade and I actually flipped the pyramid upside down, where we were on the bottom, and. Uh, and our responsibility was to support everything uh, above us, right? Which was right. Our, our airmen and the mission. And so, you know, we, again, we were just enabling, uh, they were driving the direction of the wing. They were driving uh, a lot of the decisions. Um, you know, we were just enabling them to do so. And, yeah. and enabling, empowering them with that level of decision-making authority at the lowest level. And we would have, you know, E2s, E3s, uh, making decisions that affected the entire wing at times. Uh, and we celebrated those. Right. And, and so, uh, I think that's another pitfall the air force falls into more often than not is that you can only make a decision if you're an E nine or an O six or whatever the case yeah. may be. And man, we are woefully wasting talent and, and expertise uh, by abiding to that sort of antiquated mentality, in my opinion. I agree. I couldn't agree more. I'm with yeah. you. I, uh, yeah. The most yeah. important guy is the guy w on the front line with the rifle or the guy on the flight line with the wrench or the, you know, exactly. the, the, the finance person, all those people that are actually doing the work. That's like you said, that's, I love that analogy too. That's, I love the way you said, you know, turn the, turn the pyramid upside down and you're supporting everyone else. I mean, that's a good visual. That's a perfect way yeah. to, perfect way to say it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the challenge that I think, um, again, I've often heard, you know, leaders in the air force, you know, that they talk a good game and, and they'll say a lot of similar things, but when it comes to actually, uh, executing against what they're saying, then oftentimes it's a, it's a much different story. It's like, for sure. Well, we, we say we empower our airmen, but God forbid uh, uh, an E6 makes a, a decision like that. That can't happen. Right. And so <laughs> right. They're, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. And yeah. so, again, uh, our, our airmen, our airmen see through that bullshit immediately. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it doesn't take more than 30 seconds um, when you start listening to, you know, a senior leader speak uh, and you know whether they're genuine or not or whether they're just yeah. trying to, you know, toot their own horn and, and blow smoke. So uh, you're not fooling anybody by, right. by trying to, to say one thing but do another in execution. So, um, you know, I, I, it was it was a great assignment to end my career with. Um, again, I'm really fortunate to have the opportunity to, to be a part of that organization, a very historic uh, organization in tow, right? It's actually um, the oldest uh, fighter wing in the Air Force. Uh, oh, really? Was, yeah, Barnes was established uh, in 1947, wow. and right has, at the beginning. Yeah, has had you know various fighter aircraft. Let's say two, four, six, eight different aircraft uh, since its inception. Uh, it'll it'll quickly uh, convert to the F-35 mission. Um, so just a historic unit. Uh, it was a long time A-10 unit. Um, oh, yeah. in the early days of Iraq. So, you know, again, it was, uh, the 104th fighter wing was a 10 was in, uh, direct support of the task force, uh, in the early days of OIF. And huh. so you think about, uh, Tommy case and Billy Otter at Haditha dam, like all in all those guys, like yeah, Air 104th Brandenburg, fighter yeah. squadron. Yeah. 104th fighter squadron, a 10s were overhead in support. And so no kidding. Uh, along 
yeah, long history and, and That's heritage awesome. there. So, uh, yeah, this is a great, great organization, uh, great opportunity, and I'm glad to have finished up my career there. Yeah. So speaking of that, so you retired. Um, what do you, do you do? You want to talk about what you've been doing since you've been out, or any kind of like initiatives like uh, that you've been working on uh, since then? Sure. Yeah. So when I first uh, retired, I, I had the the privilege um, to to be a part of the Warrior Pack. Um, okay. So sure, probably well known with with your audience. You know, Warrior Pack makes you know batteries. Uh, the power all of our communications, you know, radios and, and C2 right. systems uh, field across Air Force Special Warfare. So um, I, I joined Sean and, and Rolo and, and Brian Patton there uh, with, and Laura and, and Gian and Team Warrior Pack. And uh, really, really grateful for the opportunity that they gave me straight out of uh, active duty to, to be, become a part of that team. Um, just a phenomenal team there and uh, yeah, learned a lot. Yeah, a bunch of great guys. All those yeah. guys you just mentioned are heavy hitters for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, just the leadership there. And again, the, the genuine leadership and caring that, uh, that Laura and Gian bring uh, to the team is just, uh, just what I needed exactly after I retired. So I, I spent uh, six months with, with Warrior Pack uh, supporting, supporting that uh, mission and, and obviously direct support Air Force Special Warfare with, you know, high quality batteries and power solutions. So, um, and then through really their mentorship, Laura and, and Gion's mentorship and support, um, you know, gave me the, the courage to kind of step out on a, on a, on a different journey that I'm, which is what I'm on right now. And so one April I started working for a, a company called uh, Firestorm. And so we're, we're a small startup. Um, one of the, the founders is a former teammate of mine, Chad McCoy is a career pair rescue man, spent 18 years at, at JSOC. Uh, in the okay. 74. So and I highly recommend, you know, you get him on here, man, because that dude has done it all. Okay. Um, and so what, what Firestorm is, is, you know, we, we build, you know, radically affordably, radical, uh, radically affordable 3D printed uh, small modular UAS. Oh, okay. And so what's unique about what we're doing is, you know, we can 3D print the entire airframe uh, in nine hours. Wow. And and then, you, you know, of course, you put all the guts and stuff in it after that, but uh, yep. it's completely modular. So think about, you know, a Lego set. So you can 3D print these things, put it together like a Lego set and, and get these things, you know, from nothing from just raw print material to an operational modular UAS in about 24, 36 hours. Wow. And so that's awesome. That, yeah, that level of manufacturing capability and the modularity piece that, that we bring to the, the UAS world is, is not been, uh, seen today. Um, okay. And when I say modular, what I mean is when let's say other people talk about modular, they're talking about, Hey, let's, let's take this, this ISR camera off and let's put a different one on. When, when, when Firestorm talks about modularity, we're talking about from, from nose to tail, wingtip to wingtip and everything in between, all of that is completely modular based on our, our 3D printing uh, capability. So what does that mean? If, if you need wider wings, just print wider wings, man, and, and maybe get uh, increased endurance and, okay. and loft and uh, you know, lift and that sort of thing. Um, if I want to swap out, I can certainly swap out the camera if, if I want to for a different one. But really, in the, the payload bay is, is really where the modularity, I think, um, versatility comes into play. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we're, we're all SOCOM mod payload compliant, which basically means that it doesn't matter which, you know, high speed uh, sensor that just came on market or where the uh, software defined radio, whatever the case may be, you know, our, our comm kind of sled that goes in the, the payload bay, it's just built and designed. So you can just plug and play those things. So that's what we talk about. When we talk about modularity. It also extends to our propulsion system is right now we're, we're running a micro turbojet engine, which is pretty badass. Um, okay. Like, you know, and we're, we're doing short takeoff and landing, although we do have the capability again, based on our 3d manufacturing, uh, we can mate the fuselage to accept, mm -hmm. you know, existing catapult or other launch mechanisms that are already fielded out and across the DOD. 
Uh, but you can swap out the, the turbojet for an internal combustion engine. You can swap it out for a battery powered uh, pusher prop. You know, that's, and all of that modularity and that swappability is achievable in the field in less than five minutes. So you could have like and a so, Pelican case full of all those modules and you're like, okay, I need this thing for this particular mission. Take the other thing out, plug it in, yeah. and boom, you're ready. Yeah, you don't you don't need, you know, three or four different systems. Uh, you know, we're, we're not, you know, we're not saying that we can do everything. What we're saying is we're, we're providing, let's say, a flying USB that enables the operator to make the decision on, hey, what payload, what capability do I need right now based on my mission requirements? What we're providing is is the capability to to very quickly uh, plug that thing in, whatever it might be, get get the UAS up in the air uh, and achieve ranges out to 200 miles that um, other other systems can't even touch. Nice. So uh, we're excited about uh, where we're at. Uh, we're on the precipice of, of a lot of great things. We got a, a tremendous growing community of interest, not only on uh, Air Force Special Warfare side, whether that's, you know, through the STSs or the ASOSs, uh, but certainly within AFSOC and, and SOCOM. Uh, and so we're, uh, you know, we're, we're excited about the potential of, of uh, you know, Firestorm Modular UAS supporting Air Force Special Warfare in the future. So hopefully, you know, there, there's folks out there in your audience who can be listening to this and watching it that, uh, that are part of that community. Uh, part of, uh, you know, let's say TACP Vision 2030 and, and all the validation and things and testing of different CONOPS uh, that are going on where, you know, we feel that uh, this could play a significant role in increasing capability for, for the JFAC and the JSC. Sure. So what's, uh, how can they find information on your uh, UASs? Like what's a good website for it or like how do they, how do they get more yeah, info? I'll tell you that. Yeah, best way probably would be to, uh, you can look us up on LinkedIn, just uh, Firestorm okay. on LinkedIn. Uh, that'll get you to uh, our LinkedIn page, and then there's a website link uh, on our LinkedIn page to get to our website. There's not a lot of data on our, on our website, to be honest, and that's that's sure. intentional, right? Because there's right, a lot per, of per, kind of proprietary, that, is that what they, proprietary type stuff that you don't yeah. want everybody getting their hands on, I'm sure. Yeah, not, not just yet, man. Like, uh, we got a lot of patents around uh, a lot of our IP, but uh, but that that'd be a good okay. start point. Uh, look us up on on LinkedIn. That'll get you to our website as well. Uh, but if at least they can reach out to you, maybe get you know some more data from you or some more information. Yeah, dude, one hundred percent. Yeah, okay. I'm on LinkedIn as well. I uh, I was never a LinkedIn dude until I uh, retired, but uh, you can you All can right. reach me on LinkedIn, and uh, or my my uh, email address is just. Brett at launchfirestorm.com. Two ways to get a hold okay. of me. Sweet. Well, man, this has been great. I was so excited to get you on here because number one, uh, you're a stellar guy. I mean, you just you've done so much uh, cool stuff. But also because I wanted to hear more about that that two four aspect that I've never really been exposed to. So I, I really can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on here. And I, I uh, it was great talking to you. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, and, and on that one, I, I would also yeah. recommend to your audience if they want to learn more about the, the seven two four specifically. You know, they, the seven two four has got a YouTube channel. And uh, I would highly encourage uh, anybody in the audience that's interested in pursuing that uh, that path to start there, man. Trey Free uh, runs the Insight Through Experience podcast, uh, and he posts all those podcasts on the 724 YouTube channel. And so just go, just search oh, in cool. YouTube 724 Insight Through Experience. Uh, you'll you'll find that channel. I just start at the top, man. In in every one. Every episode, you're going to glean something that's going to benefit you. There, there's book recommendations that it gives you. Um, they're fully open kimono in terms of what they're looking for uh, in, in an operator. And so uh, there's interviews, uh, post-selection interviews with guys that just finished the selection process um, across all special warfare career fields. So uh, it's just a good yeah. source of information. Uh, he does a great job of keeping it updated uh, with the latest information uh, on, on how to apply nice. and, and, you know, I wouldn't say tips and tricks, but just some recommendations to, to prepare yourself both mentally and physically. 
Yeah, that's a good point because I, I don't, I didn't even know until you and Kirk started doing. It, I didn't realize that was an option to be an operator. I thought it was just all fires desk. So yeah, maybe this will give another avenue for you know hard chargers out there that want to want something different, kind of like you. Were yeah, saying. and and I would say that there's a lot of. Uh, I'll use the, the, the latest buzz term. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, so just go straight to the source. And, and that source, in my opinion, is is the 724 uh, YouTube channel. Okay. Sounds cool. Good. Well, again, Brett, can't thank you enough for coming on, man. I really do appreciate it. All right, brother. All right. Have a good one.